Thank you all so much for joining us today for the PRB spring meeting, both in person here in Washington, DC, as well as virtually. I'm April Melvin, I'm the staff lead for the Polar Research Board. And I'm just gonna go through a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our board chair to get us started. So just, uh, I think most of you are connected to Zoom, either in person or in or online. Um, we ask that you just check how your name appears. And if it isn't clear who you are, please update your name so that everyone knows who's participating. Um, online, we ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. And for those in the room, we ask that you use your microphone and do not connect to your computer audio or we will get feedback and know that you've done so. <laughs> Um, and please keep your video on if you have the bandwidth to do so while you're engaged in the conversation. We ask that you use the raised hand function if you wanna contribute um, verbally to the conversation and we'll call on you um, when there is a, a chance to do so. And if you need any assistance, you can send a direct Zoom chat or an email to either Lindsay Muller or Caitlin Cruz who are um, working behind the scenes here in the back of the room. Go to the next slide, Lindsay, please. Oops, sorry, move ahead to uh... Thank you. Um, so we ask that, that you um, are a partner with us today in setting a, a positive conduct. Please, please uh, disconnect from the audio. I'm not quite sure who it is. <laughs> so, Just a second here. We're... All right, thank you. Uh, so we are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, inclusive environment where all participants can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on identity-based factors. And we ask that you are a partner with us on this today and if you see or experience harassment, um, please get in touch with me or you can reach out anonymously um, to the number and email that are listed on this slide. Next slide, please, Lindsay. Um, I also just wanted to give a brief land acknowledgement. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that a number of people are joining us virtually today, but we, this meeting is being hosted at the National Academy's facilities, which is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nkonshtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations and the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations in this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. And we acknowledge that our understanding of environmental change it is informed by indigenous knowledge and experience and that many native communities are on the front lines of impacts of these changes. And thank you all again for joining us today. And I now turn it over to Martin Jeffries, our PRB chair. Well, thank you, April. <laughs> And welcome everybody who's now joined us in the open session. Thank you for joining us. Um, we welcome your participation and we even welcome your questions and comments in due course, should you have any. Before I go any further, I want to thank the National Academy, the PRB staff led by April for helping set up this meeting without their hard work, we wouldn't be sitting here today or joining by Zoom. So if we have a successful meeting, all credit goes to April and the staff. If it's less than successful, then I will take the responsibility and come and chat. Um, we have, a, I think, a, an interesting agenda over the next two days. And I hope, I think we'll all go away having learned something more than one thing that's of value um, in our professional lives and more particularly with respect to international collaboration in polar science and international polar year number five that we are now really uh, embarking on properly as a polar research board uh, in our contribution to realizing a successful um, U.S. contribution to participation in International Polar Year 5. 
This board owes its origins to the third international polar year, which is better known as International Geophysical Year. The National Committee for IGY, as it was called in 1957-1958, became the Polar Research Board. So we have a long and distinguished history and association with International Polar Year, I would say. And that's why we are now eight years ahead of the next International Polar Year already planning and preparing for that. That long history of um, National Academy and Polar Research Board association with IP IPY is, for example, exemplified with the PRB's contributions in the early stages, well, actually all through and after um, IPY4 of 2007, 2008. And if you could bring up the slide, please, Lindsay. Yes. So in about 2004, um, or yes, about then, the, the Polar Research Board established a U.S. National Committee for IPY4. It says 2003 up there. But then in 2004, um, it wrote up an initial report with a framework for U.S. participation in IPY4. Uh, this was done in collaboration with uh, federal agencies, the Polar Research Funders, um, not the least to encourage them to get involved um, because after all, any US participation in research with either a domestic or an international collaborative focus requires uh, funding and most polar research funding has always come from and continues to come from the, the federal government agencies. And, and this report also identified, it's called Key Scientific Challenges. Here, I think you could read that as key science priorities as well. What were some of the critical scientific questions that an IPY4 could address? Because they are the types of questions that require collaboration across borders and boundaries and so on. The types of very large globally or regionally important questions that no country alone could muster the resources or the will to do alone. And that's really what IPY, International Polar Years, are about to my mind. I think we, we must stress the international collaboration because they are international polar years and they are about working together as researchers in teams, bringing together diverse talent, experience, expertise to address these critical questions, which today it's not difficult to enumerate what they are in the polar regions and with respect to the impact of the polar regions on the rest of the world and, and vice versa. The, if you could uh, hit the next arrow, please, Lindsay. And then the next activity that the Polar Research Board and the Academy um, worked on was um, a workshop to come up with an implementation plan for IPY4. Um, and, and again, this promoted working with, collaborating with the federal agencies who would be, um, at that time, it was hoped they would fund International Polar Year research. So there were discussions on how do we address these science challenges or priorities and developing a process for the coordinated activities that would be required uh, to achieve success, to find some answers to these critical questions, these priority questions. And these two reports, um, they are available online. I'm pretty sure they're still available at the uh, 
the National Academy or the National Research, Web, National Research Council website. You can download them as PDFs or um, if you really want the hard copy, you can buy one, I think. Um, but they're worth looking at and help to inform our work uh, today. IPY did go ahead, IPY4 did go ahead, and we're going to hear uh, in a few minutes um, on some of the uh, successes, legacies of IPY4. But um, there was, after IPY4, the PRB and the Academy returned to the fray, if you will, and it did um, oversee, sponsor, if you will, a Legacies and Lessons uh, report, which I'm sure everyone's seen and is familiar with also, and it too is available uh, online as a PDF or hard copy in the mail. So PRB has a long history of association with international polar years, and it, I see it as our responsibility um, on behalf of the much larger United States polar research community, Arctic and Antarctic, it's our responsibility to help realize what I envision as an outstanding US contribution to International Polar Year 5 to help create the opportunities for our polar research community to collaborate with their counterparts overseas to answer big questions. I think of it, IPYs are not for business as usual research. These are not in my mind for incremental research, making another step forward, identifying another question to write another proposal for. IPY should be, we should be aiming very high to achieve leap ahead discoveries. That's language from when I was with the Navy, um, but you know what that means. We need to make giant leaps forward, addressing critical Arctic, Antarctic and global questions. And through that, achieving innovation, et cetera, et cetera. To, me, to my mind, that's how we would judge the success of IPY5. Next, please, I've talked about, okay, that's the end of the slides. The, the, folk, the uh, cover of the report is by a young boy from Seattle, I think, was that right? It's a wonderful piece of art. Um, so let me see, what, I'm, what else am I supposed to say? I think that concludes my remarks. Um, set, I hope that sets up our day today and, and also tomorrow, um, but also thinking ahead longer term um, to what we might want to be recommending for what success for an IPY5 might look like. So with that, I. What's, what time is it? 10.15, right on time. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I have April here uh, whispering in my ear. I just should acknowledge that here in the room, we have maybe two thirds of the Polar Research Board present and others are online. Time, the schedule is tight. I won't ask people to introduce themselves. But there's the list now on the slide up there and on your computers. Um, the current board membership, um, take a quick look at that. So you, you know who they are and um, know that they are available to be for you to contact them. The point is that PRB members represent the larger US Arctic and Antarctic research communities. And therefore it's important that board members bring to the board and thus to the national academies um, feedback from the broader research community, their concerns, their questions, whatever it may be for us to discuss, for us to advise the national academies on 
issues that it might be worthwhile or important for us to pursue in our role as advisors to the, <coughs> to the nation. It's also important for the board members, I think, remember you also have a responsibility to communicate back to the research community in whichever way you uh, are able uh, to do that. It's important that the broader research community knows about our work that we are doing on the community's behalf. And I hope they understand we are doing our best and we're doing good things uh, for, the, for the community. Okay, so now um, let's move on. I am pleased to be able to introduce two people from, from overseas, as it happens, um, who are going to give us an overview of the current vision for IPY5. And I'd like to welcome Gerlis Fugman from the International Arctic Science Committee. Um, she is the executive secretary, I believe. And then also we have Chandrika Nath, executive secretary. I'm, I'm sorry if that's not quite the correct title, Chandrika, but uh, Chandrika is with the SCAR Secretariat in Cambridge, UK. And Gerlis, I believe you're in Iceland. In Iceland, yes. Good. I hope you're enjoying good weather. Uh, actually, new snow. Of course. <laughs> But at least, the, at least just some distance from the volcanic activity at the moment. So Gerlis is going to kick off with um, an overview of the Arctic side, if you will, of the current IPY5 vision, the white paper that was published back in the fall last year. Chandrika will give the Antarctic perspective on that, and then we'll have time, I hope, for some uh, questions or comments. And, and one thing I would add, and maybe both Gerlis and Chandrika will mention this, that this vision statement was um, put together by quite a group of a dozen or more organizations, which many of you would recognize, but including IASC and SCAR, permanent participants to the Arctic Council and, and other organizations. So Gerlis, please, Go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much. And uh, I should say that Jenrika and I will do this uh, presentation jointly together. Uh, we split it up um, and uh, in the true fashion of this being an international polar year, really emphasizing that uh, fact that this is both about the Arctic and the Antarctic. So we're very happy that you invited us to speak today about the progress for the planning for the international polar year and about the visions. And we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your input into this process. It's a very open process, very uh, still uh, in the early stages where we really welcome any input that we can get within the planning. If you can move on to next slide. So the first discussions for the uh, IPY planning started in early 21 already with discussions among several of uh, international Arctic and Antarctic organizations. Um, you have several of the organizations that are involved within the planning process at the moment listed below, um, the International Science Council, World Meteorological Organization, IASC and SCAR really uh, spearheading from the, um, uh, the planning as well. And then obviously the um, Euarctic, uh, IASA and several other organizations, APEX, um, as well as, and this was a very important point for us from the very beginning um, to include uh, Indigenous, uh, the permanent participants um, in the discussions from the very first uh, planning discussion that we had. The um, discussions evolved over the course of the next two years. Um, and then we ran also the decisions or the idea of having another IPY, uh, both by the IASC uh, Council as well as the SCAR delegates, and uh, have issued then in December 22 a joint statement uh, of IASC and SCAR in cooperation with WMO, ISC, UARCTIC, IASA, APEX, and other partners confirming that the planning is going ahead for an IPY and that we're welcoming input into that. 
Um, the first official document that we then produced was this concept note that you have seen um, and that you, uh, April shared the link to. Passing on to Tanrika. Next slide, please. Thanks. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, great. Uh, wonderful. Well, really nice to be here today. Thank you for having me along. Um, it, when the next slide appears, I, oh, there we go. Um, so a little bit of context from the SCAR site. In April 2022, we ran a survey of our community, which many of you may have participated in. And uh, we had just over 430 respondents and about three quarters of those had been involved in the fourth IPY. So um, that that survey indicated across the spectrum of these respondents a broad support for a fifth IPY as something likely to foster research that wouldn't otherwise have been possible. And the respondents expected that the fifth IPY could have impact on, in a number of areas. Um, about a third of the responses indicated improved public perception, another third improved um, impact on policy in the polar regions, and then about a quarter felt it would boost their own research and about 10% their own career. So that's just from the SCAR side, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the broad support base for this initiative and what people felt at that early stage that um, they and their institutes and countries might get out of it. Girls, I think it's back over to you. Next slide, please. Next slide. So why do we want to have an IPY in 2032, 33, which is 25 years after the uh, last IPY, with the other IPYs having been more on a 50-year um, cycle? But the changes that we see in the Arctic are so dramatic and so fast-paced that we think we really need to draw emphasis to it, and we cannot wait another 25 years to really have another highlight um, year or uh, effort, international effort to um, to address the changes um, that are happening. So um, the IPY in uh, IPY five is to bring the longstanding tradition of organizing regular IPYs to an era of unprecedented need for large scale coordinated research in polar and global changes. It's supposed to provide a vital opportunity to close outstanding major knowledge gaps through targeted attention and globally coordinated action. It is to foster vital cooperation among countries, disciplines, programs, and knowledge systems to produce urgent, urgently needed actionable information to support evidence-based challenges. It's supposed to build on the methodological, technological, as well as epistemological advancements of the fourth IPY, including major shifts towards working across knowledge system. And it is to achieve a step change in transdisciplinary polar research through meaningful integration of natural sciences, social sciences, humanities research, and indigenous knowledge. Next slide. Thank you. I'll, I'll speak to this. Thanks. So this is a very simple graphic of how we see the um, the, the the roadmap, as, as it were, for the um, fifth IPY. So you'll see here the, the fifth IPY in 2032, 33, but it's not really about a single year. It's in a number of phases. So currently we're in the phase where we're engaging different stakeholders, um, and then we would move into a phase where projects can actually start to take place. So ramping up to the IPY um, in 2032, 33, and then a legacy phase. And this graphic sets out a number of milestones along the way. And I'll just pick out in 2030, SCAR and IASC are planning to hold a bipolar conference, a joint IASCAR conference. The last one was in 2018 in Switzerland. So that will be um, a big milestone event towards the, the, the build-up towards the IPY. And we've also indicated here a number of projects which are relevant to the fifth IPY. So, for example, the UN Decade of Ocean Science, uh, under which sits Antarctica InSync. You may have heard of those projects. So these are relevant to the fifth IPY. They're not at this stage a formal part of the process, but we're talking to, to those involved in those initiatives so that we can closely align 
Great. Thank you. Next slide, please. I think that's back actually, to you. Actually, I should, should add also from the Arctic side, obviously, the current process that we're doing with the ICARP, uh, the International Conference on Arctic Research Planning, is really about to set the scene and to develop input and uh, foci for the International Polar Year um, for the Arctic side of that polar year. So in the last two years, the discussions have evolved and we have um, so far um, been organizing a planning group of currently about 17 international organizations that are involved um, and have uh, started to set up a interim planning structure, uh, interim because it's still rather loose and will uh, develop a little bit more in detail over the next uh, few uh, years, um, an interim ex uh, plan and IPY planning group, which includes all the organizations that are involved with the planning and will include additional organizations in the future, um, an interim executive committee with uh, IASC and SCAR represented as well as WMO and ISC um, to lead and guide the process in the, uh, further on. We're setting up certain um, task teams um, to develop and to address certain issues uh, in more detail. Um, in the current stage of the planning, we have decided to create four task teams that are um, will be looking into uh, the vision and priorities for the International Polar Year. A second task team will be looking in IPY, uh, in Indigenous leadership in involvement uh, in the IPY. Then a third task group will be looking at uh, country and funder involvement. And this is where especially you from the uh, US Polar Research Board can quite a bit contribute. And a fourth task group will be looking at capacity building and early career coordination. More task teams will be created over the next uh, couple of years uh, as the planning evolves. Um, the IASC and SCAR secretariats are um, hosting a temporarily a temporary interim IPY secretariat at the moment. Um, we're doing this in addition to all of our other tasks and work at the moment without an additional position. And we're looking very much into uh, seeing how a, a proper IPY secretariat or at least additional positions for our two offices are uh, possible to help and assist with the planning over the next years as things are speeding up in more detail. And you can contact us if you have any information and leads for us. Um, next slide, please. So what are the key steps now, especially in the next two years uh, of the planning uh, process? So we'll be opening the summer a call for other international Arctic uh, Antarctic and international organizations to join the IPY planning group. As I said, it's currently 17 organizations, but there's a lot of other inter uh, organizations involved within Arctic and Antarctic research that would like to join and we're opening this up. The call is currently being prepared by us and will be published in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're also updating the uh, concept notes that you uh, can see here linked. Um, and we'll be holding throughout 24 and 25 public consultations and engagement of uh, stake, uh, polar stakeholders, rights holders in the research community in defining and shaping the plans and visions for the IPY. So we're really encouraging you to contribute to that discussion and con con contribute the U.S. perspective into that uh, discussion. As I said, also, we're looking into identifying hosts and funding for the IPY Secretariat. And then towards the end of 25 um, is our deadline for uh, um, defining this ramp up period, as you've seen in the graph that uh, Chandrika showed earlier, um, the ramp up period towards the IPY from 26 to 31, which are projects that are connected then to the IPY that might have already present the first results during the IPY, uh, but are they're, they're located beforehand with like Antarctica and Sink and other big initiatives that are um, happening within the polar regions. And that's it, I think, from both of us, unless for Chandrika, you have anything else to add? All no, right. that's good. That's good. Thank you, Gillis. We welcome all of your questions and uh, happy to hear your perspectives and contributions. Gillis and Chandrika, thank you very much for, for that overview. It's very helpful, and particularly to know that you're aiming for October for the updated concept note, which will be um, a bit, a few more pages than the concept note, I imagine. I think many people are, are looking forward to that. Um, so I 
take this opportunity to open the floor to board members first, if you have any questions or comments for Gerlis or Chandrika on what you've just heard. Jenny. Hi, Gerlis and Chandrika. Um, before this meeting, I, I sent out a, a note to Cryolist um, saying that we were having our first discussions on IPY and received a lot of feedback. So the questions I'm going to ask here today aren't necessarily from me, but from the community. So I just wanna make sure that, that you know that this isn't necessarily from me, but from the community. Um, a, a number of people said that they were happy to see that an IPY was going on, but they didn't understand, uh, or they felt that it was kind of a closed process and they didn't know how to get involved or, or who to talk to. Um, unlike the last IPY where it felt like it was very bottom up and grassroots. And they, they knew that this uh, de development of the new concept note was coming out, but they didn't see a place where the list of writers were listed. So they didn't know who to contact and then it just seemed a little more closed. And, and I know um, both of you are very much interested in opening up to community. So I'm just wondering where that disconnect is coming from and what might be done to, to make that a little bit, I don't know, more open. Thank you. So if I may comment on this, so the um, the idea why we kept it relatively close at the beginning of the discussions, first of all, we started a little earlier than in the planning of the last IPY. Uh, we wanted to have at least some kind of a um, idea or vision for or um, broad concept for the IPY before we took it too much um, <laughs> too wide essentially and see where the interests are making sure that really we, we create something that is both Arctic and Antarctic balanced. Um, this is why we kept the discussions so far uh, in a in a limited group, but we kept everyone and at least informed about the discussions at least within our organizations. Um, to move this forward. We realize now we need to move this, uh, open it up even further. This is why we're now inviting other organizations to join. Um, there will also be a website um, coming over the next uh, couple of months uh, for the IPY where input can be provided and visions from everyone. And the goal of the stakeholder consultations uh, or consultations with the community over the next two years is really to make sure we get the input and that this polar year is something that everyone can identify with and has their visions included. So it might have been a little closed in the first two years. We also need to keep in mind that this was a bit of a difficult time over the last two years. Um, but uh, but this is an open process. We were coming uh, feedback, and this will be very much more open now that things are moving into a more structured way and uh, with an open platform and uh, various discussions at upcoming conferences. And we really encourage you to participate in that as well. Um, yeah, I, if I can just add to that, as girl says, um, we fully intend that this should be every bit as open as the last time. And to some extent, maybe the the plans are at a much earlier stage, I think, than than people perhaps appreciate from the outside. There isn't a there is no fixed secretariat or resource behind this yet. So I'm not using it as an excuse, but obviously resource is a factor that we are currently keeping this going just in whatever time we've got at our secretariats, and there is a limit to how broad you can open things out when you haven't actually got the the people power to do that. So this is something we've been talking about, town hall meetings and stakeholder fora, and it is designed into the process. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Gerlis and Chandrika. We have a couple more questions here in the room. I think Mike Hartinger, you have one. Um, yeah, thank you for an excellent talk. Mike Hartinger here from uh, Space Science Institute. Um, my question, uh, well, I have a, a comment along with some more lines. Um, there's a lot of folks in the space weather and heliophysics community who want to get involved in IPY. And I think you sort of answered how, how they can become involved in your slides, but I just wanted to um, clarify if there are other organizations, for example, SCOSTEP or COSPAR, or these organizations that do a lot of space science research who should be involved, how do they get involved? Are you gonna release uh, this this call um, to like IASC list or will it, be, will it be a public announcement or how does that work? 
It will be a public announcement and all organizations that would like to join can definitely join. And especially we've been, talk we've been also having or discussing initial ideas, for example, of lead products or lead activities. And if you remember from the last IPY, there was a space task force, if I remember that uh, as well. And so there is definitely a lot of um, um, openness to have you all involved and uh, organizations should really make the use and, and apply for this call. It will be open and any organizations within research, indigenous organizations, anyone can join and be part of this discussion. We have another question in the room here from Adelheid Herman. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Curlis, do I have to say join audience? No, no, no. Okay, no. sorry. Um, I just wondered about, uh, you, you had talked about the task teams and uh, you mentioned something about capacity building. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, task, uh, capacity building, there will be one, um, and this is an effort led uh, among others by APEX and the University of the Arctic, who will be working on uh, making sure uh, capacity building early career researcher involvement within the IPY is, uh, is a really strong focus. And they have set out a, a few uh, tasks in making sure and in integrating early career voices in the IPY planning process in identifying existing cooperation frameworks that can be represented and supported and establishing the coordination and engagement of relevant bodies within this, this planning process. So there's a, um, a bit of a, work that this task group uh, will be now taking on. Thanks, Nellis. We have one final question uh, from a board member, Lynn Talley. Lynn, if you would go ahead, please. Hi, um, thank you so much for getting this going. <laughs> um, when you're asking for um, involvement of organizations, are you also asking for involvement of, well, so, I assume that it would include the Polar Research Board. Um, would they, is the idea that the Polar Research Board would come in as an organization to participate? So we're keeping the call at the moment to international organizations. That is the, the key thing. However, um, the call at least for joining the IPY planning group. However, there is a task group that is being set up for national involvement to really also get the Polar Research Board in the US as well as other national countries uh, to engage within the process. So that will be a separate um, separate team that is being set up for that. Other, the, the, the reason why we're keeping it in the, in the, in the IPY planning group on the international organizations is to um, avoid it getting too large. It's uh, <laughs> otherwise we'll have 500 plus organizations and we need to specifically for the national contributions um, have a coordinated action because it's the, the US has, has ideas, Canada, Norway, other countries have ideas for their contributions and we need to create a forum for that specifically. So that will be a separate forum to contribute. However, you can, as the US Polar Research Board, contribute your visions already definitely to the IPY planning process. And we really welcome you to do that. Okay. Um, and so um, I, I work on the Antarctic side. Um, would an organization such as uh, SUS, a Southern Ocean Observing System, be considered international? Are they part of your planning? SUS, SUS are already part of the of the process. So I think um, to add to what Gillis said, it's partly an effort to avoid duplication of um, a duplication of efforts. So I think that's why we we've split this at the moment into internationals on the planning group, and then we'll have a separate task force for the nationals. I think you'll find that the bodies that you're working with are already tapped in. So SUS is already involved in, well, I guess the in our discussions. Is Maybe the follow up is that is whether the um, Polar Research Board should be um, should be actively engaged with the international groups that then are in the planning. Um, I, I'm thinking ahead to um, you know that maybe others have thought much more much harder about this. Uh, funding um, is going to have to come from national organizations, and I feel like the UN decade, for instance, has fallen very flat um, in the U.S. because. Um, it was never really associated with anything. There was this international organization and then there was a national organization. And um, I realized that the IPY has a much firmer foundation in having done this 
you know, over and over, um, unlike the UN decade. But I, um, I just uh, think that the reason we're starting so early is is so that we have um, uh, time to uh, build a program. Yeah, exactly. If if I may quickly answer on this, um, so there is a. Um, that is the reason also why we started so early in the process. We want to learn from the from the last time where it was a rather late in the planning process. We want to make sure that there is time to build actual planning pro uh, programs and funding. As I said, country involvement or also funders involvement is a really strong emphasis of one of the task groups that is being currently set up. We're also working closely among others with the Arctic Science Funders Forum and others that bring the funding organizations together to make sure they're involved in this process and we can work with them um, in, in, in terms of developing uh, programs for the International Polar Year. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, girl is and I, I think girl is yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Can I? Can I? Yeah, I just wanted to add. Um, girl has mentioned a that one of the task forces will be on identifying the science priorities. So, of course, we'd want input into that as well. Um, all these partners. So that that is another process that you, I'm sure, you'll want to tap into via your um, your link your linkages with these international bodies. Um, but also, Gullis has mentioned the word interim a number of times, so I hope you appreciate that this is a, a structure that we've set in place for now and are very open to modifying or changing that as it works for the community. So none of this is set in stone. This this is just the, the way things have been set up to get things going for now. Okay, the, the, the clock is ticking, so I will thank Gullis and Chandrika for joining us uh, today. We really appreciate it. It's, and it's very valuable to hear from you representing IASC and SCAR. And I want to thank IASC and SCAR for playing a major part in kicking things off with respect to International Polar Year and shepherding the concept note forward and the expanded concept note. Um, I would just finish the session by saying that the Polar Research Board is already involved in this in these early stages that you've heard about from Gelis and Chandrika, the Polar Research Board, Board appoints the national representatives, the US national representatives to IASC and SCAR. And so they have already had a significant say in uh, the concept note and the expanded concept note. Um, as it's been pointed out, these are early days Things will evolve and grow, and I am quite certain there will be ample opportunity for individual researchers and organizations, et cetera, to contribute their recommendations in due course. I'm sure it will be opened up because there will be great demand for that. Again, thank you, Gailis and Chandrika. It's very nice to meet you virtually. Maybe one day we'll meet in person, um, but again, we must move on. So. I leave you to return to your day. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Very good. Um, so well, let's move on after that introduction to IPY5 from the international organizations, IASC and SCAR. Uh, we'll go to our first panel. Um, which is the Lessons and Legacies panel uh, on what did we learn from IPY4 um, in terms of planning, preparation, execution that could inform how we move forward with the same planning, preparation, and execution of IPY5. We we should learn from the past to inform the future so that we don't make the same mistakes twice, get a black eye or black eyes, instead have an even better IPY5 than IPY4. So I'm going to hand over to uh, our two co-moderators, Anupma Prakash and Jenny Baseman, and they will introduce the panelists and then they will run the panel. So over to you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, my name is Anupma Prakash. Uh, 
and I am the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, welcoming you all to this, uh, this session on lessons and legacies. Uh, the good thing is we are planning 10 years ahead now, uh, having a lot more time as we ramp up the preparation for uh, the IPY5. Uh, in this panel, what we're really, really keen to hear is just to know where we're going it always helps to know where we're coming from. The lessons and legacies uh, link that you saw that April put in over there has a lot of that information, but that's uh, about 16 years old and it's time to refresh, uh, refresh our memories and recall uh, things that really went well in um, IPY4. And then also hear from our agencies and our researchers on how they mobilize resources and what were the lessons, what were the successes, what were things that we have to keep in mind as we go forward here, um, and what advice they have as we ramp up now on this timeline uh, on things that we should be doing and we should be keeping ahead um, in, our, in our mind. So with that, I am going to turn to Jenny to introduce herself, and then um, we'll, we'll introduce the panel after that. Thank you. Um, I'm Jenny Baseman. I am currently an international polar consultant, I guess is what the, the name tag says. And I had the pleasure and the privilege of helping to shape the future of polar research um, by helping to start the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists um, during IPY4 um, and, and got to know many of you uh, around the table and, and uh, look forward to, to helping to set the stage for the next IPY. So with that. All right, um, I'm going to request our panelists uh, to introduce themselves, uh, starting here in person with Renee Crane. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm not able to get my camera working just yet, but I'll try to have the one that's facing me get started soon. I'm Renee Crane. I am a program manager at the National Science Foundation in the Arctic Sciences section of the Office of Polar Programs. I've been with NSF since 2002, so I was there through the planning and implementation of the previous IPY, and in all likelihood, I'll be there for the next one, or at least just approaching it, so uh, we'll have that going for us. One of my main roles during the previous IPY was to really shepherd and help support education and outreach efforts. I was running the education program for the Arctic Sciences section at the time, in addition to leading the field research support and logistics for the Arctic. So um, I don't know how much in depth you want us to go at these. <laughs> I, I think that is that is good for this. Okay, this yeah, yeah. So I think uh, for all panelists, we ask in your name, your affiliations, the area you worked in, especially with the context of IPY4. Yes, thank you. Um, moving online to Julie Brigham. Yes, this is uh, Julie Brigham Gretty. I'm at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst um, for the, and I'm a, a quaternary scientist. I study past climate change. For the IPY, I had a, a large drilling project, scientific drilling project in the in Russia during the IPY, and uh, and then later, uh, of course, served on the on the uh, lessons and legacies uh, report. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Moving on to Robin Bell. Go ahead, Robin. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was unmuted. Um, thanks for convening this. I'm Robin Bell. I'm at Lamont Dury at Columbia yeah. University. I'm a geophysicist interested in ice sheet stability and what's underneath the ice sheets during the IPY or in the ramp up. I was the chair of the um, Polar Research Board. Um, and I was also the chair of the uh, International Planning Committee before um, the ICSU Planning Committee. And I also had the honor of helping lead the AGAP project to the interior of East Antarctica um, as part of the International Polar Year. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Uh, moving on to Simon Stevenson. Hi, I'm Simon Stevenson. Um, I'm retired now at the time of IPY4. I was the head of the Arctic section. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Jenny, turning to you. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot of collective IPY knowledge as well as um, knowledge of polar research in general amongst you all. 
Um, so if you could kind of set the stage for us, perhaps, um, take us back to the, the early days of, of planning of IPY4 and what, what made you decide there was a need for, for IPY4 and why did you shape it in such a way where there was these large international projects and how did you decide which ones were, were important at the time? I'm happy to leap in because I was kind of at the start um, as the chair of this body. We There were all sorts of documents swirling around with various various concepts of what an IPY looked like. So the as uh, Martin noted, we convened a workshop to see if, if, you know, if it was a good idea, if we thought it was worthwhile with for the PRB to get involved. And I think we called it, you know, should we have a party or should we, should we celebrate or should we actually do some science? And we fell down on, let's, because we're geeks, we're better at science and parties. We fell down on the, the science side. And um, very shortly after that, I think the PRB met in the fall and Chris Rapley contacted me over Christmas and we submitted a paper to ICSU to, to put in place a um, a planning group. And what's very interesting is in parallel with this, um, Chris Elfring, then the um, April, the staff officer for PRB, worked with the PRB and we were able to secure funding from the National Academy because we were able to make a significant, um, a case that this would be a significant activity for the Polar Research Board. And as just listening to what's going on now, realizing that that funding supported both the workshop that Mary Albert, whose IC is here, ran to help set the U.S. Um, priorities, but also through Chris Elfring's participation in the International Planning Group, which is why I found it fascinating that they didn't want PRB at the table, because that's where the early resources came from, was from the National Academy having funded the PRB to say, okay, we're going to help launch this. And I think I'll stop there because I can talk about lots of things, but that's kind of, I didn't get into the how we selected, but I'm sure that will come up, Jenny. Any of the other comments you want to any of the other panelists have something to add here? So, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add. Um, I'm not sure this actually answers Jenny's question because uh, the at the at this point the NSF was sort of watching what the community were, were going to to do and how it was coming, you know, forward. And um, I think it's I, somebody in the previous session mentioned the bottom up nature. Uh, mm -hmm. At this point, um, this was very much an activity of scientists getting together, the international bodies getting together uh, under the UXU umbrella, um, and more the agencies sort of watching how this was uh, sort of unfolding. Um, the Academy did hold some important meetings uh, after uh, the, the ones that Robin mentioned. Um, at one point, um, uh, uh, the White House, the uh, OSTP, gave the nod to NSF to, to be the lead for that. Um, and I think that's probably when uh, Carl Ove was the head of uh, Polar Programs at the time. It's when Carl sort of uh, agreed to catch the ball and uh, and provide uh, you know maybe more support. And then there was some very uh influential hearings uh on the hill and i don't know if we're going to go back to that but uh yeah so so we we were sort of watching how this was coming together um we're as a funding agency we just you know we expected to fund uh projects uh, coming forward yeah can can i uh bring up at this point um you know uh this I heard it already this morning, um, but there was this also this ramp up. You saw, talked bottom up, but that bottom up was also driven by everybody wanted their projects included, right? So so that so there you know, we bottom up is is exactly what happened is because um, everyone wanted their project to be endorsed by the IPY, right? So um, we were. Uh, having some fun remembering these honeycomb diagrams 
and that uh, and Jenny, I, I don't know if you have a chance to show the picture, but but I think that um, uh, I, I think it's a way to capture the enthusiasm of the science community is is they no one wants to be left out. We already heard that this morning, and and I I know that the honeycomb diagram really drove a lot of collaboration that and it and it increased the speed at which international groups came together. So I'll just I'll stop there. Yeah, I would just add that. Uh, so from within NSF, we started to have meetings and form a sort of internal committee. Um, we started to reach out more to oh. our agency colleagues about what they might want to do and put together a, a white paper on the different priorities for agencies based on these planning documents that were being developed through international collaborations. I think the presence of the International Program Office and Dave Carlson spending time there um, to kind of provide some leadership and focus and organize things through that honeycomb diagram gave us uh, some areas to focus and develop research solicitations for proposals. Mm -hmm. Actually kind of dovetailed on what Simon is referring to in terms of um, appropriations hearings. It all started to come together a little bit, almost last minute, just in the nick of time, I would say. I'm really glad we're planning this far ahead. Great, thank you. And um, I'm glad you brought up Dave's uh, crazy honeycomb chart creation because I think in that chart um, and, and perhaps in layers of that chart, there's a number of um, really amazing successes from IPY4. And, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us from, from your point of view, what were some of the activities or products that came out of IPY4 that wouldn't have been done if it wasn't for such a large scale international effort? Hmm. Um, let me, maybe I'll jump in first. Um, I had this, uh, we were building forward with German and Russian colleagues to do a big project in, in Russia. And it, it kind of, you know, six, seven years out could say, hey, the IPY is coming. And um, maybe we could hook our wagon to that. Um, and it was important in order to get the buy-in of the Russian uh, agencies, the Russian permits, all of that collabor uh, collaboration was um, perhaps an excuse for the Russians to be involved in this, you know, and to endorse what we were going to do. So um, I, I still wonder to this day whether or not we would have pulled off that project had it not been for the IPY because of the buy-in that was happening there. And, um, you know, simultaneously we had the Andrel project going on in Antarctica. So uh, those were to me two really important things that came together at an international level uh, that um, I think was a, was a success and driven by the IPY. I can, I, I'm going to add, but I'm not going to focus in on specific projects. There were just too too many. Um, but if I can, I'll uh, sort of step back a little bit. And I would say um, at, at NSF, uh, going into, during, and coming out of IPY, we were uh, just re remarkably pleased with the creativity of the community as they came together for the education and outreach. Maybe be easier for me to say that than Renee, because she was right in the middle of it and, uh, and and helped to make that happen. Very strong collaboration with the education directorate. Um, but it, I mean, that was just a, a really high point. Uh, people were were doing sort of amazing things that we really, it, it just sort of transformed how we thought about what uh, polar regions could do for education and vice versa. I'd also say observing was a key outcome, uh, particularly sustained Arctic observing. I think IPY created some of the dialogues that um, that this was actually something that the research agencies really needed to do. Um, and for the Arctic, it, it basically transformed the way we thought about that for the years to come. Um, so that was a sort of a step function. Uh, there was a very significant space element to that. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't really tightly linked with the ground observing, but it was a success. I don't know much about it. 
uh, because that community were already rocking and uh, they did really, really well. And at some point you might want to listen to how that came about. Um, Julie mentioned Russia. I would say during this period was probably the most open Russia has been to international collaboration in Russia since IPY1. Um, so, you know, it was uh, it was very timely. I'm glad we did it. And at last, it's, it hasn't been sustained. And I would say the last thing I would say, again, from this sort of uh, higher level, is the seemingly endless dialogues amongst international, uh, both researchers and also funding agencies, I think led to a stronger international uh, level of trust and sense of collaboration that allowed us to sort of rework IAS um, as part of the, the effort. So I, I can't remember the exact dates of when IASC was sort of uh, uh, re uh, transformed, um, but it came out of a sense of trust and a sense of common purpose. Um, and it was actually, it could have been quite tricky, but it really wasn't. Um, so I'd say that those are things that came out of IPY. I would say the interagency trust level and collaboration also grew out of IPY and we saw more engagement in IARPIC, and that has continued and grown. And I think a proliferation of Arctic meetings and interest in the Arctic and, and the Antarctic as well have, um, I think the, the Antarctic had a sustained level of interest. I think the Arctic was a little bit, um, not as much paid attention to by the public. And I think some of the education and outreach efforts helped. And I think um, IPY helped the polar regions really reach people's, the front of people's attention in terms of their importance to the earth system. I mean, I think the successes are a couple. There's the science kind of, you know, whether it was Mary's Traverse that I think, I only think of it as Mary's US Norway Traverse because there she was at the South Pole leading it. I thought that was so cool. Um, uh, Julie and her teams drilling into Lake E and the AGAP project that I was a part of. and. And Polnet, also led by Terry Wilson. And there's something in that that you'll hear if you listen carefully that one of the legacies was, was allowing um, mid-career women who had ideas in the pipeline that they'd been working on the international stage for years to move forward and to actually get funded in a way they wouldn't have been able to get. You know, the seven nations that came together with the project I was on would not have happened without the IPY. I know because some of the partners tried to pull out several times and it only kept on going because of the IPY framework. So there are science projects that are only possible because of the International Polar Year collaboration. And I would argue that there was a wonderful step in diversity as we defined it at that point of who was at the table. And I think, uh, you know, this is one of the issues I reflected on after our prep call is that we've expanded our definition and how we're attacking diversity. So we have an opportunity to look at what was successful last time in terms of diversifying the polar community, science community and see what we can do now given where we are. Um, and so I think those were, to me, those were some of the, and also Apex clearly, given when you look up and down who's on this screen or who's listening in this room, the number of people who came out of that support of early career scientists, or even just look at that table of who's on the PRB now. Um, so those in my mind are sort of the, um, some of the highlight successes that I see, the, the empowering, the diversity, um, the empowering of the next generation, and the and the and I, it's interesting having listened to what people said they want. I still think there's a knowledge piece that the PRB should be pushing is that we still want to learn more about how the polar regions work, and so I hope that that remains front and center. Yeah, can it, can I follow up on that? Um, just looking forward, I mean, certainly what's different is our attention to appropriately, you know, braiding indigenous knowledge and science. And so I'm sorry, I can't participate this afternoon to listen to your other panel, but I do think that, boy, we we cannot blow that opportunity this time. I think I really look forward to um, seeing that better integrated and 
Um, you know, a lot of people have said if we all treated the planet with the same reverence that indigenous people do, we wouldn't be in this pickle. So uh, anyway, I hope, hope those discussions go well this afternoon. Yeah, those are great points. There's, there's a lot you all talked about, the international collaboration. Uh, and also I see in the chat some uh, responses coming out on successes of individual projects uh, that were done. So I wanna dwell a little bit more uh, deeply into this topic and, uh, and ask that you reflect on how that international research coordination went by, you know, how did it come by? Um, was it just serendipity? Was it just putting everyone in the room? Did it start from individual researchers at the grassroots level? Or were there some policy things that happened at the international level that facilitated these large scale international collaborations that would otherwise be so difficult to, to happen? My I'll just leap in here. My sense is much of it was grassroots. There was very little seed funding. If I were to, you know, say how if you wanted to foster more collaboration, you would actually put some planning money. I mean, NASA does this all the time. They figured out you can't build teams if you don't pay people um, to participate. So you know, the I, I think so. That's why I think we saw a lot of projects and ideas that were already fermenting or seeds that were in the ground that hadn't quite sprouted because it wasn't the right season. Um, IPY was the right season. And I think with a little more time and money, there's the opportunity actually to foster new collaborations this time around um, that I think may not have been as easy given the short time frame last time. And there was some relabeling. There were some things that were already on the books that people just said, okay, great. <laughs> this is going to happen between 2007 and 2009. This is an international polar year project. So there was some relabeling going on. But I think, again, with some thoughtful planning and recognition that planning takes time and money, um, that this time it could be richer. So I'll, uh, I just agree with Robin that um, the strength was the researcher to researcher level last time around, and much less so. Um, I, I, I'm, I think I'm speaking from the Arctic, perhaps, and not less from the Antarctic. Um, uh, but there was sort of just less uh, acknowledgement. You know, as Robin said, you you, you know this. This planning takes, you know, funding. You have to get it together and have to have the meetings. I think those meetings happened at the researcher to, to researcher level at some level, um, you know, at AGU and things like that. But um, we were talking amongst each other uh, in the research funding agencies. This is when the EU started to participate, and that was sort of very helpful in the Arctic. Um, but uh, what we were not doing with a few exceptions was putting, getting the mechanisms together that allowed coherent funding decisions across countries. Um, and so uh, that's a, that's gonna be a challenge uh, for IPY5. Uh, it's always a challenge, but uh, it, you know, uh, I, 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 I am actually a little bit more optimistic because I think uh, say at NSF, the international group is, you know, has has had some successes recently on working across uh, international boundaries. So, um, but it it remains a challenge. Yeah, I would add that there. I think that at the time, there were some scientific questions that were fairly obvious that needed more attention and needed long term observations to address. So, I think there was a stage set there for really increasing observations. And it's similarly in the Antarctic, you know, so you have PolNet, which, you know, deployed instrumentation around Antarctica and also in Greenland and, and some projects like that that really increased our observing capacity spatially and that sort of synoptic way with multiple countries investing resources in observations that now we have a long, you know, lengthened our time series of information and we can do more in this upcoming IPY. There were, some workshops. Um, there was a, an education focused one, Bridging the Poles, which happened in 2004, mm -hmm. which gave people an opportunity to think about what they would want to do 
for education and outreach or to address um, the increasing public understanding of the polar regions piece that was identified in the planning document. So I think we, you know, there's the opportunity to fund some specific planning type of workshops and engage people. I think the in-person really was a big, a big deal. We did have people come to NSF from international groups and meet with us and express their interests and their desires to collaborate. Simon touched on the notion of being able to co-fund things internationally, which is just super challenging mechanistically. But in the intervening time, we've done, we've done that. We've created some mechanisms where one international organization has the responsibility for the review and the decision making, and then the funding would go to that organization. It used to sort of be that NSF would take the lead and we would take other people's money, but now we have other organizations where NSF is willing to trust the process and invest in those proposals that come out of the competition. So I think we've set the stage and I think other funding agencies may also be willing to do that. With education, we had a lot of interagency funding. There was a suite of projects that were identified and funding from NASA and NOAA came to NSF to fund some of those projects. The Smithsonian Institution was another big partner. So I think we'll be looking to build on what we were able to accomplish last time going forward. Well, that's great. Uh, no, I'm, I'm really happy to see the progress in the international fu funding landscape over there that uh, Renee, you talked about just now. Um, but just looking at the next IPY and the international collaboration and just thinking about what worked in IPY for and where we can learn more from, um, it's just about the timing of the international uh, collaboration. Did they all come together about at the same time or some nations lagging, some going ahead? Uh, just, just a little more in depth in, in looking at IPY and our political landscape now uh, on how do we think we can get um, a buy-in from all the international communities to be a part of this network moving IPY um, 5 in a big way. Um, can I mention something that um, I was looking through my notes from long ago. I amazingly found them in my office. Um, and I noted, because back then, when we did the Lessons and Legacy document, we were still thinking about the next IPY in 50 years. So there wasn't any talk about uh, 2032. And even in that at that time period, back then, we were talking about, well, in the next IPY, 50 years from now, there could be an, uh, ar the Arctic Ocean could be ice-free in the summer. Well, guess what? Maybe in 2032, <laughs> we could be facing and uh, summers with without sea ice. And so that that urgency, um, I think, is going to be a real uh, a real driver and maybe a way of co uh, cohesion that's going to bring the countries together to think about the consequences of that reality and um, all the fisheries and all the other things that that are moving with as the Arctic Ocean opens up. So I think there's an opportunity here where the science communities and the international communities will come together. What to do about Russia? I don't know. Well, that's a work in progress, but um, I see that as a uniting a sense of urgency that might might be a successful um, um, target idea for the IPY, the next one. Maybe I'll follow on that because it's something that I've reflected on recently is that Antarctica is still pretty big. It hasn't actually gotten any smaller. I mean, a little of the ice is gone, but it's still a very big, very difficult place to work. And many of the places that we're worried about changing in the future are hard to get to. And if the IPY provides a remarkable framework on how to bring the community together and look at, I'd say particular East Antarctica, but look at this, say the ice sheet at, holistically in as opposed to one-off heroic expeditions. And I think that's what, you know, the science community and the PRB and the, the scholars around the table have an opportunity and the funders have an opportunity to think about how to do that because, um, it is big, it is changing, and the only way to understand how it is going to change in the future is through international collaboration. And 
this is an opportunity to bring those groups, and particularly in Antarctica, who are building infrastructure together. Yeah, I would just emphasize the couple of those points that IPY is an opportunity to do something that's bigger that one nation or one you know group of researchers by themselves can't really do. It's an opportunity to go to places that are difficult to get to and to focus resources on those things. And the like logistics part of me says for both the Arctic and the Antarctic, it's gonna be really important to pick some focus areas because we won't be able to do everything. We know we have budget constraints. We're headed into IPY with those things in mind and we wanna be successful. So let's, let's plan ahead and really pick and choose where we need to be with IPY projects and resources to advance those big ideas. Thank you, Renee. Uh, just talking about budgets and finances, I want to dwell into another question on the funding landscape. Uh, if you can reflect a little on what the funding landscape was like in IPY4, and what was the what was the steps that really put it together? What was instrumental in putting together uh, the funding for IPY4? I keep hearing uh, Simon and Robin talking about um, this one point, one meeting that changed some things. So um, I'd love to hear a little more on the funding landscape and how it all came together. So I can uh, jump in. I'm never quite sure what a funding landscape is, but I, while you're in it, um, it always seems a little rough, right? There's always a looming budget cut somewhere or you're in a continuing resolution, whatever that is, you know? And so you're always feeling uh, pretty beat up, but in fact, um, in the decade before IPY4, um, Senator Stevens had been really quite supportive of Arctic research. And uh, there was a strong indication that he would continue to do so. He had uh, encouraged NSF to set up an Arctic uh, group uh, to, to do the funding uh, for uh, Arctic research uh, within polar programs. Uh, he had also um, uh, brought into a report uh, that uh, identified logistics as a weakness in the Arctic and uh, and sent a, a, a fairly significant chunk of money to NSF to improve logistics in the Arctic. And that was like 1999. Um, so he had already sort of proven himself to be sort of open to this. He had uh, uh, also supported NOAA uh, to, to help development of Utki Havik. So uh, I, th I think the funding landscape um, should have been reasonably optimistic if you could see it from at least the top of the hills in that landscape. Um, if you're in the trenches or in, you know, in the valley, you might not have felt particularly uh, optimistic. But the, the Congress needs people to sort of lead and, and sort of show what the opportunity is. And that occurred. And... Um, and then the uh, and then the funding agencies could could move forward. I will say this: it was nearly all NSF, other than the education piece, which Renee's mentioned. Um, the, most of that new money went to NSF. Uh, I would like to think that in IPY five, um, we at least in the Arctic, there would be um, you know, a stronger support ac across more agencies. And I'll just chime in that um, the PR, you know, this is where you as a PRB have the potential to step forward and lead because it was through Chris Elfring and the, I have no idea what they're called, the, the part of the academy that worries about federal relations and um, hearings on the Hill, that they arranged a hearing both in the House and the Senate on the International Polar Year. And from that is where, you know, there there is this line that Simon and I will never forget, where Senator Stevens did say something along the line of um, to Lisa Murkowski, you take care of the science, I'll get the money, honey. And who could forget a line like that? Um, little sexist, but whatever. Um, but it means that there are still people in, you know, around who remember that process and that that's a capacity that the PRP has is to be able to present the case to um, the Senate and the House. 
Renee, I saw your lamp lighting up, so go ahead. Um, yeah, I think those are all good points. And the need for champions is there, the need for leadership to you know, go speak to why we want to do IPY, what, what the benefits are. Um, the agencies, you know, we have a whole budget process or kind of outside of being able to plan those kinds of things. So I think we should, you know, take Robin's point to heart. Um, and, and there was some funding that came to NSF to support projects. And hopefully the same will be true in the future. I think we also have to look forward to some re renewed infrastructure in the Antarctic to support research that's been uh, work in progress and will be ready for science soon. Um, and then, you know, going forward and similarly with Summit Station in Greenland, which some of you are familiar with at the top of the ice sheet where um, we have had a long-term observatory, there's an emphasis on renewing that infrastructure in time for IPY 2032 as well. So we are thinking ahead. We, you know, <coughs> continued relationships to um, make platforms available to our research community through international collaborations such as icebreakers. And those relationships, you know, grew and flourished during IPY and have continued on. And so in addition to just research dollars, which are really important, I think those research platforms are also important and we continue to work toward making sure we have the capacity to support field research. Um, can I add, I think it was Renee that reminded us this during our prep call that apparently the United States will be chairing the Arctic Council during the next IPY. Is that right, Renee? Someone else who mentioned that, and I think that was a good. It's yeah. not a one hundred percent match, but there will be a large overlap. Yeah. So that's another opportunity for the United States mm -hmm. to take a leadership role through the State Department as well. Mm -hmm. Right, and and you know maybe the Arctic Council in the meantime here is going to be ramping back up in some capacity. So, um, you know, I don't know. There may be some opportunities there for the international level of collaboration driving funding. Excellent. Uh, there is uh, also a question here uh, about, you know, in our legacy report, there is a mention about something to take uh, think about is how can we have mechanisms for more effective international collaborations? And, uh, you know, and we're just looking at uh, the lessons learned from I IPY, which is also something I want uh, us to reflect on as a panel. Uh, what were the challenges? What were the shortfalls? Um, how could we avoid those in IPY? And in that big question, if you can also think about the recommendation of the need for more effective international collaborations, that would be great. So I'm going to open this up to the panel and I'd like us to dwell more on a little bit more on this effective international collaboration, but also other challenges that we saw in IPY4. And just so that we keep that in mind on how what to what to avoid or how to do things differently as we plan an IPY five. I can jump in. I think there was a disconnect between the international funding for partners on big projects. So something might have reviewed well in its home country, but not reviewed well in the U.S. And so the U.S. partners didn't get funded, or vice versa, it might have reviewed well at NSF, but the international partners didn't get funding. So I think being able to close that gap, uh, maybe have more joint opportunities for funding would be beneficial and something we have made some progress on in the past. Within, within education, was different countries are set up differently for their formal science education. And it was, it would be difficult for any one project to, you know, infiltrate schools across the world and um, so I think there's something to think about there, but informal science education is a little more translatable across different nations. So museums and other centers for informal science education. So something to think about ahead of time, you know, is how to do effective engagement with the public and education of all forms and outreach. Um, in addition to sort of, in a sense, marketing IPY, we had the logo, different organizations made things. I have some artifacts here. This is Noah's lunchbox with the IPY logo. There's an IPY patch um, that was sewn onto a lunchbox. So different giveaways and things that are engaging the public that make people want to be interested. And I think we maybe fell, fell a little short on being able to do that. But there, there were some good ideas and some organizations did it better than others. 
Um, I, I think that public education piece is something that we can build on even more going forward and the, and the funding disconnect. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, I'm simply unclicking, so I'll leap in. Um, I think the challenges, as I saw them, were the late arrival of money. We heard that. And that that may have come from some lack of, you know, lack of real engagement and or lack of engagement higher up at the funding agencies that to take this seriously. Um, that that was seemed to, you know, that seemed to be a hurdle. There was also um Something I've already started to hear a little bit this time around was the jostling, for, a little bit of jostling for leadership and room at the table. As I think Julie said before, everybody wanted to have, have, have their honeycomb on it. But uh, the, there's already this sense of how do you make sure everybody's at the table and feels welcome and everybody's resources are brought to the table. I, that's going to, that was a challenge for us. And I already see that's going to be a challenge this time because there were probably the group that's in the room could write, sit down and write a plan right now that would capture about 60 to 70% of what's going to happen in, but that's not, and I saw that happen several times during the planning process, but that's not what's, that's not building the community and the connections that you need actually to have the research and the education and the indigenous communities you want to actually make it happen. So that's one of the, the, the challenges that I think we faced and you're going to face is that when somebody puts something on the paper, it seems like it's engraved in stone. Um, and I think my, it was a challenge be understanding the lessons of, the plans evolve and it's the process. I can remember being yelled at as part of the international committee that what we had on the table wasn't right. And then we had to do it again. It's like, okay, fine, we'll do it again. And guess what? We did it again. And it was almost identical, but it was the process. But I still can remember getting yelled at for, you know, having done it the wrong way. It's like, okay, fine, we'll just do it again. But it's understanding that it's the process that matters as much as the end goal, the end product, because you're building shared vision. Simon, you were about to say something that time, so. Uh, yeah, I was, but I, I can't remember. I was just listening to Robin. And uh, so I, I can't remember. Oh, well, I, so at the very beginning, Martin talked about, um, you know, uh, we should be doing something sort of different uh, for IPY, not business as usual. I don't know whether I agree with Martin on this point. Actually, I, I very rarely agree with Martin. But, um, it, but I do think, you know, some of the successful projects that used IPY move forward, they would they were just nicely built, crisp scientific targets that could be done. Um, and I think that's that's sort of the fundamental building block that any funding agency can sort of get behind. You still need to have the coordination and these mechanisms that uh, different countries can put their funds sort of together to do a a project, um, but um, so maybe I'm agreeing with Martin. It, 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 these needs to be these the, the funding agencies can can do this and do it best. I think if the if the projects are you know sort of crisply defined and they can uh, they the agencies can justify putting that that amount of money into uh into something um that pulls together the international side and also will get a great result yeah we hope to i mean it's science you 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 might get a negative result but you, you hope to get a great result you know another thing we all kind of forget but you know we didn't zoom like this for the last one when we were planning it 
Right. And so the the ability of the international community to talk just the way we are now, I mean, th this is a game changer for organization and bringing people together and including, you know, South Korea and probably Japan or China uh, in in the IPY in a way that wasn't happening back then. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of planning and pulling together the international community that will be so much easier this time because of this capacity we now, now have to talk to each other and be face-to-face -face kind of around the table. So uh, that's kind of an exciting thing to think about. That's a that's a big game changer. Thank you, Julie. I think that brings us to kind of the, the last question we had as moderators before we open it up to the to the group. Um, April, I think <clears throat> you might have that this wonderful honeycomb diagram that I know many of us have burned into our into our images and our minds, but <clears throat> this was the honeycomb diagram from 2007. And I mean, it, Dave has lots of these different ones that highlight different things, like one that has the highlights the indigenous participation or different countries versions. And, and they're all somewhere online. Uh, we didn't do a great job, I think, of archiving the IPY. So that's a lesson um, that we learned, but those are just some of the projects. And I think some of the other things that came out of IPY were things that we didn't know were coming out of IPY. Um, I heard the word champions before, and, and that was one thing that, right, there were people who just bubbled up out of nowhere who, who created things or, or, you know, got the whole community around something, the process of designing some of these IPY um, ideas or topics that created this community. There was a lot of just different things that happened that I don't think could have been predicted. And, and so it's, it's wonderful to try and, you know, set out some ideas, but I think it's also important that we make sure there's space for some of these new things that came up. Um, we, we mentioned uh, education and not being able to get into the classrooms, but now we have Polar Educators International, which came out of IPY. Um, and, and Julie, I think you mentioned when you wrote the uh, Polar Research Board uh, report, you were planning on having the next IPY in the next, in 50 years. But in fact, at the IPY conference in Montreal in 2012, Gerlis Fugman, who uh, presented the plans for the new I for the next IPY, on, was the president of Apex and announced to the world that the next IPY would be in 2032. And she is now helping to lead the charge of planning the next IPY. So I just think it's wonderful to see that some of these things are coming to fruition. And, and just to take advantage of, of those of you who have been around for the IPY before um, and, and thinking of some of the important science questions or, or non-science and education ideas, what do you think are the important things that need to be priorities for this next IPY. We, we need to set up, um, we need to help establish why the ration, what the rationale is for this next IPY. And, and I mean, we all, those of us who participated, you know, know it's all about community and the ideas that come out of it and these new things, but there are some critical science things and sea ice was mentioned. What are some of the other like big scale things that we really need to do to be game changers? I mean, I would. I'll just go back to this indigenous knowledge and and science. I think that's that's a that's a, a really important priority in it, in my opinion that we need to build on that and and make the make this whole process much much more inclusive. I, and, go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I, I would. I, I would just agree with that. Um, except I would. Uh, not just inclusive, but there has to be a place for Indigenous leadership in the research. Uh, you know, it's going to be very broad, um, but I think, you know, uh, creating, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's a piece of the honey, a, a honeycomb cell or a honeycomb theme, but it should be uh, projects led by uh, residents of the Arctic and Indigenous uh, uh, people in the Arctic. Um, I would say for us also in the in the Arctic, um, there's got to, there's got to be. So this is not what I think you were getting at, Jenny. But these are sort of broad things. Um, there's got to be a place for the um, the thinking that's coming out of the uh, interagency Arctic process. So uh, we, we, we're we're 
that world also has transformed since the last, for, since IPY, um, and uh, you know, for the for a much better place. And I think there's uh, this, this sort of thinking in that community, um, and they have mechanisms to, to help have these discussions. So, uh, so I think that's a, that's a good thing. I, I don't feel I'm very well qualified to to speak to the scientific themes. Um, you guys are, are much better to do that. Um, I'll chime in here and both on a um, challenge and an opportunity looking ahead. The challenge is when you look at that honeycomb, and I love honeycombs, I keep bees, so I think it speaks to me, but it was still siloed. You know, if you look at it, Earth's over there, ice is over there, ocean's here, and those systems are linked. And I think that's one thing I'm not sure we did as well as we could have during the last IPYs, actually figuring out how to bring those communities together, right? The communities were dri driven ahead to answer the questions they knew were burning. But how we need this as residents on this planet, we need to bring those people together to actually understand the big question, which I think will can't help but bubble up, but the stability of the ice sheets, right? And the the emphasis on change in the polar regions and how poorly constrained it is and poorly constrained because of a lack of observations. So though, you know, in my mind, that's very likely to bubble up as, as you start thinking about planning from many, many countries and many um, scientists and policy makers and stakeholders really want to know by 2050, what's going to be happening to the ice sheets. So that's both a, a, a challenge I see coming from the last one and moving forward to an opportunity. Jenny, can I ask a follow-up question to Simon here? Uh, Simon, you mentioned in your previous response that observation networks were really, really important. And uh, in IPY4, there was a great movement in space observations, but lack as much in ground observation. Do you think IPY with its broader network, IPY5 has opportunities to ramp up the ground-based observation network that would then uh, complement the other observation networks? Yeah, so, so what I tried to get at was IPY created an environment, IPY4 created the environment where people now accepted Arctic observing, sustained Arctic observing. We're nowhere near having built the system. Um, and, and maybe that's the challenge for IPY5 is actually to put in place, um, you know, so, sort of the infrastructure, and I mentioned infrastructure, building infrastructure. So, put in place the infrastructure that actually is an Arctic observing system, except for we've, we've lost Russia. Um, and I, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how you overcome that, but uh, so th that's probably uh, the way to take that is, is so the IPY4 made people think, yeah, it's okay for us research agencies to be talking about sustained observing, but IPY5, maybe we could, uh, make a major step in actually building the infrastructure to do it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think in addition to all of those things, um, there is a focus on the, on these big questions. I think, well, I did listen to the two plus hour summary from the 2010 meeting or something. And Richard Alley makes the point that we are still underestimating all the change. And so I think that's just only an argument. And, and, and that was 10 years ago. So that was, it's only an argument for better observing to constrain models. But I think there's also room for uh, moving in the direction of more social science driven questions, more use inspired research or uh, research that's useful to decision makers in a more overt way. Um, as we, I think some, some of our agencies are moving more toward this and, and thinking about sustainability and the decisions that people have to make in light of the changes that we're seeing. Um, NSF did some things also, um, we did one good thing, which was we have the general social survey, which is a survey of 
the population and asked some questions. We included some questions about the polar regions and before IPY and then asked those questions again mm -hmm. after IPY to see how people's perceptions of the polar regions may have changed or what were some of their priorities. Um, I think being able to do something like that ahead of time in an even more organized fashion than we did previously. Uh, but where we didn't do things that I would have liked to do would, would be to go back and do some sort of evaluation, especially of the education and outreach and public engagement types of projects. There was maybe a missed opportunity to actually perform an actual evaluation. Um, and maybe similarly, you could conduct some type of, you know, sort of how, how successful were we type of evaluation for uh, IPY writ large. And in preparation for hopefully, you know, continuing with these, because I think these, these big benchmark efforts really do have a place in research because it is a little different than the everyday. And it is getting at questions that individuals or, or single funding agencies or single nations can't do by themselves. I, I think you, um, you, evaluation was a definite missed piece there. Um, and I think data um, was another one that we, we missed the mark on. And I think uh, people are still searching for IPY data, uh, I think. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for, for the vision of, of Forward. And I, I think Anupma will, will turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as we open up to questions over here now, one is around the room. I would request you to put your name cards a little tilted towards this. I set them up so that I could see them from there, but I can't see everybody's names from here, but that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, we're gonna open up uh, for questions here, first from the uh, PRB members and then also from others who have joined us and uh, Jenny and I will tag team on this one. So questions for the panel, Martin. Thanks enough, Mary. Um, I worked at NSF for four years as an IPA rotator. It still gives Simon nightmares, I'm sure, of the memory. Um, but his, his hair is grayer than mine, which may be related. Um, my time at NSF overlapped totally with IPY4. I was there as program director. Um, after my four years at NSF, I walked two blocks down the street to go and work at the Office of Naval Research. And very soon after stepping through the door there, I got a surprise. And that was, I found myself working for an agency that had no problem sending US government research funds overseas. ONR easily funded <coughs> overseas researchers to support research that was of interest to ONR and the Navy. It wasn't a huge proportion of the total budget that wouldn't be allowed. But the fact remains is that it is possible to send US government funds overseas for research alone. And I would hope that perhaps we have the time before IPY5 for other agencies to realize that they can do this without being called up to the hill for a hearing to explain themselves. Yeah, I was um, following up on that a little bit, but you mentioned um, that you know NSF was the lead agency. I think that Simon said OSTP gave them the nod to proceed. Um, but of course, all the NASA, DOE, Naval, all these agencies are very involved. Uh, certainly in climate change, many of them in the oceans and space observing. Uh, what efforts can we as a board or uh, would be recommended to try to make this more than just the United States a and program run by NSF, but to really pull in the other agencies more in the US? I think that's a great point. And I mean, I think that this is the body to help do that. The Academy is a place to maybe convene um, some of those, the people from the agencies that you think would like to be engaged and start having those dialogues. I think that's a good, a good point and a good idea. There are, multi, you know, yeah, so many agencies that we need to probably be talking and networking ahead of time. And, and I think the Academy is a good place to do that. 
I think the word that Rene said that speaks to what um, the PRB can do is it's it's your convening power, right? That you can, you know, you can bring together those agencies and spark the conversations and spark the collaborations. For the benefit of those online, if people in person would first say their names before asking questions, that would be great. Andre? Uh, Andre Petrov, I'm alternate delegate to IASC. I just want to also mention that, of course, the role of uh, IARPIC is really important. I think it was not there in place, right, when the previous planning was happening. So, so we really need to be looking into uh, engaging that. I have a quick question, maybe more on the Arctic side of the things. Uh, as, as everyone knows, you know, the on the Arctic um, segment, we are working very hard on international conference on Arctic research planning right now. And it was in some ways the same previously when uh, I, uh, ICAR was happening in 2005. So I was wondering in terms of planning and preparing for IPY4, what, what was the sort of the follow-up relationship or consideration of what ICAR produced in the IPY planning? I understand it's for a very short period of time in between, but just maybe give us an advice how we could capitalize best on this effort to make sure we streamlining what's happening in IPY5. Now, Simon probably yeah. could speak to that. And... Simon, if you can go ahead and respond to that. Um, so they, they, they should play, as you say, they should play together, um, but they are sort of different processes. And, uh, you know, because, so, so this probably gets to my point that they, that because all of this dialogue was going on in the uh, in the certainly in the Arctic, um, well, like a, whichever it was then, and then uh, IPY, you know, people were talking about things that they could do and do together, and so I, I, I sort of see it as a continu continuum in the level of international conversations that were happening. Um, and, and and presumably that is still the case going on now. So I, I don't really have a a big picture of should they be you know pulled apart. I, I you know I, I think it's just good that the community is talking and has these opportunities to talk together. Um, but I would I wouldn't I wouldn't overmanage it. On the other hand, you know it's one more meeting that everybody has to go to or. Uh, uh, multiple meetings in your case uh, that you have to go to. So you know maybe there's maybe there's an opportunity there to to do to do more with those opportunities, but I I, I don't really know. Thanks. Um, we've got two a couple raised hands online, Ginny and then Julie, maybe. Yeah. Hi. Um, I uh, owe my career probably to IPY because I was a grad student in 2004, graduating in 2004. And I think a lot of the work that happened sort of paved the way for establishing polar sciences in universities across the United States um, in ways that didn't really exist before. Um, the one issue that I wanted to bring up was sort of how we begin to engage grad students who are coming up in the um, polar sciences now, because uh, I realize that the tenure of a grad student is, is much shorter than 10 years, but I'm going to be close to retirement in 10 years now. Um, so uh, what I would like to see is more engagement of people who are emerging in the field so that they can get started on IPY projects um, ahead of the sort of big announcement of IPY. When I came into it in 2004, it felt to me like a lot of the projects, a lot of the people involved were established people that were getting involved in IPY. And it was unclear to me how to create international collaborations as a graduate student, how to lead a project as a graduate student, all that stuff was very opaque to me. So having some kind of mechanisms for engaging students and telling them about the opportunities of IPY really early on in the process um, so that we can have a continuation of generations that are emerging in polar sciences would be um, a way to go. So I'm curious from the, the people here, what um, 
you think might be good mechanisms for including students in on some of these processes, knowing that students, you know, have um, limited resources to participate and uh, limited knowledge on uh, what they can contribute and things like that. I'm just gonna quick before the panel, um, exactly what you described is the reason that a bunch of uh, international early career scientists got together and created the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists for those exact reasons. And that organization still exists. Um, and I think is still doing great and running wonderfully. Um, different leadership over the years and is, a, I think, a wonderful channel um, to use. I'm sure there's other wonderful, great ideas that can be done, but um, I, I do think as a legacy of the last IPY, Apex is, is certainly a great channel to use to engage other new early career researchers. But I am biased, I have to say. Oh, and I think, Jenny, you're right. Apex is one of the wonderful outcomes. But And thinking about what you know, the role the PRB might play or organizations moving forward might play. AGU has a has a principle that you have a graduate student early career person on every committee, that they're just part of the community and we, that you want them engaged. So there's, you know, that might be a role for the PRB is to start thinking about how to formally engage early career scientists and maybe actually it, have a role where it's a how to some of the questions you were asking, Ginny. Maybe that's some, you know, maybe that's a sweet spot for the PRB this time around is how to foster that continuity and the and the career paths. We'll take the question from Julie next. Hi, thanks. Um I'm Julie Raymond Jacobian with Quirk and a board member. Um I first had a comment about what one of the panelists said uh, earlier in the conversation about how I think Robin said how process is just as important as outcomes and that um, there's a need for a shared vision. And with regard to Indigenous communities and organizations and their participation, um, I just wanted to say that, that that time is now to be doing those things, to be establishing those relationships are reestablishing them um, and, and to start bringing people in now to be able to create that shared vision. And my question for the panel uh, along those lines is that we heard a little bit about from you about the involvement of indigenous communities in IPY4. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more from, um, from those of you who, who are interested in sharing about more about the challenges that were faced in engaging indigenous communities in IPY4 and if you think that those challenges from then are still challenges today or if there might be be different ones for IPY5. I'll, I'll uh, take a sh shot. Um, so, so there actually, there was, there really was uh, not very much uh, Participation from indigenous communities in in the Arctic in in IPY four, um, really it be it, the, the landscape actually transformed uh, shortly thereafter, uh, and I think the ASSW in twenty sixteen, which was uh, hosted in Fairbanks, was a major step uh, in bringing. Uh, indigenous communities right into the dialogue it was it had been building but that was a major step and i think i offer currently uh the interagency uh federal efforts currently are another major step um so that's why i think julie and i both basically said you know ipy5 should be different um and you know ipy4 was not a great model for us. I mean, I think this, there were social science questions and that those were good, those are good projects. Um, but what we're, what I think the challenge uh, go, going forward, Julie, is, is, uh, is, sort of, is to recognize the changed landscape and do it differently um, for, for a, a, a major block of uh, the equivalent of the IPY five's honeycomb diagram. You know, it would it would look different. Who's leading it would look different. 
what the questions are would look different, how the teams come together would look different. That's that, I think that's 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 both the challenge and the opportunity. Yeah. Just, yeah he said ahead. it perfectly. And that's that's I think it's a we haven't we don't want to miss this opportunity. Do it right this time. Excellent. And I'll just kind of just add one thought since Julie raised this as an issue. And I think the PRB should reflect on whether or not the direction the international group is going, which is putting a, an indigenous group off in one group. Is that the way to go? Or is this, are we looking something where it's more woven together with a, with, um, a seat at the table? Or is, anyway, that's just my observation and tossing it out there for you guys to mull over because I thought that was interesting. Thank you, Robin. Uh, we do have Michael Hartinger is uh, in the room and has his hand up for a while. We'll take that as the last question over here. Oh, uh, thanks, yeah. And thanks to all the panelists for a great discussion. Um, I wanted to go back to the point about um, poor observing networks and also working across disciplines. And one thing in the space weather community that's been really important for us is pole net observations. And, more widely, the, um, just um, observations collected by the geodetic research community, anything to do with GNSS, essentially. And my question is, like reflecting back on the planning for IPY4, were you talking about um, shared logistics and shared infrastructure, where there wasn't necessarily immediately and obviously a science connection across disciplines, but you wanted to collect the same data streams? And how can we maybe enable that in IPY5? I'll just toss out that, you know, I'm not sure. I think somebody who the PRB might want to speak to might be Scott Borg, because he thought about a lot that, particularly in Antarctica, that he might be a resource to reach out to on this on this topic. I think, I don't feel, I certainly know how in the science project, I was interested in how the logistics, shared logistics spun out, but I, I'm not qualified to look at the bigger picture. So I think somebody like Scott would be a good resource for you to speak to. Yeah, and I would add that with the implementation of the PolNet project, the Antarctic and Arctic installation of stations, that we knew when we were doing it that the data would be useful for more than just the initial project that was the rationale for putting 64 GPS stations around the or, you know, ring around Greenland. And knowing that we needed to keep the infrastructure in place for at least 10 years for really for that data to pay off was known at the time because we knew that there would be other questions people would want to ask. So I think it's there and it certainly is worthy of being a topic as you as people plan what the themes are, what the emphasis areas are that let's let's put in infrastructure where we know we have some really good questions we can answer with it, but we know that there will be follow on questions and other uses besides the primary use. So the off-label applications. <laughs> and it, you, you mentioned data, which again, I think is a was a, a bit of a failure from the last one. And I just want to note that there's a few questions and some discussion online in the chat box. I know we're running out of time I'm dealing with data. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, somehow record those and, and follow up on those later. I, I see Twyla is involved in that. I know she's a board member. So hopefully um, we can come back to those discussions because I think they're critically important. We are running out of time, but if there is a burning question, one more from anyone in the audience here or uh, online, we'll take just one more and then break out for lunch. And I just wanted to announce in case when we break out that at 1 p.m. we will reconvene for the next session. And that's going to be focused on U.S. Indigenous leadership and engagement in IPY5. All right, Martin, you get the last question and that is the last one. It's not a question and it's information I put in the chat, but I feel it's sufficiently important to say it um, regarding Ginny's point about early career engagement, uh, even at this stage of IPY planning that the first major PRB event with regard to IPY5 is hopefully a workshop that we might receive approval to go ahead with soon from the high poobahs here at the academy. Um, and, that, and we've talked about this in previous meetings. This would be a workshop in which the majority of participants would be early career researchers 
who get to have a say in what we really ought to be focusing on in terms of polar research for IPY4. And that would include grad students and, and postdocs and then early, you know, assist, early career faculty and so on. But to me, it's very important that the majority be the younger scientists who are going to play leadership roles, I hope, in IPY5. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I would like to wrap up by thanking Julie, Robin, Simon, Renee. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be able to hear from people who were involved in IPY4 while we are planning for IPY5, because not for every international year can we say that we have that privilege. So it's great to um, hear your reflections on what we learned from the previous IPY. And thank you for your contribution to the planning of the next IPY. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks. April, any announcements from you as we break up here? No, just lunch will be provided right outside the room. And for those online, please just be back at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we will get started again. Welcome back to those who were participating this morning. Um, welcome to those people who are just now joining. Um, we will begin our panel on uh, US indigenous leadership in, and engagement in IPY5. Um, so I am Lauren Miller. Um, I am an assistant professor at the University of Virginia, um, just down the road from the building that we are in right now. Um, I am also a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I will be co-moderating this session with Twyla Moon and she will introduce herself. Hi everyone, so nice to see um, everyone there and online. I'm Twyla Moon, I'm Deputy Lead Scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, which is uh, part of the University of Colorado Boulder's Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. Um, but I'm actually connected to you from my home office today, which is in Red Lodge, Montana, which is um, really the homelands of the Crow, Salish, Cheyenne, and Sioux. Um, and really looking forward to talking to all of our panelists today and questions from other board members in person and online. Thank you, Twyla. Um, so just a little bit of, of um, motivation for this panel um, before we have all of the panelists introduce themselves and get into, into questions. Um, so we know that, that Indigenous per per participation and engagement in IP by five is very important um, in the polar regions. And um, we really need to focus on, I think, I think focus is probably the right word on having indigenous leadership in the planning process and um, in the process of executing IPY5 um, so that we can better prioritize societal needs for the science that, that we plan to, that we hope that we aspire to conduct in, in the polar regions. Um, and so this, this panel is an opportunity to, to um, take another step in, um, in having this conversation. Earlier this morning, if you were involved in some of the panels, we've, we've heard about um, how indigenous knowledge and leadership is, is valued in this process. And even though it might not have been included um, in, in past IPYs. Um, but this is a really good opportunity, a really good time for us to really um, get started on creating space for indigenous leadership in IPY5. Um, so I now would like to ask all of the panelists to introduce themselves. I think we'll go with, with Margaret first. So could you tell us your name, your affiliation, and what sort of brings you to this space? Yeah, hi, I'm Margaret Rudolph. My Inupia name's Anamuk. My family um, is the Mayak family, originally from King Island, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. 
and I study co-production of knowledge and kind of what brings me to space. Um, my relationship to IPY is being involved in IPARP currently. I am co-lead for a research priority team to related to observing. Um, so yeah, and I also, just a disclaimer, I've seemed to have caught a cold and so I might occasionally turn off my camera to blow my nose. Okay. Um, James, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Good morning. Um, my name is James Tempty. I'm a member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe and currently the Senior Director of Indigenous Research and Community Engagement at Alaska Pacific University. Um, joining you today from Denina Lands, um, also known as Anchorage. Um, I think what brings me to this conversation is um, my role with the Navigating the New Arctic Community Office. I'm the director of our um, uh, the office at APU. So we, we do a lot of community engagement work with the National Science Foundation Navigating the New Arctic Program. Also a part of the planning committee of ASSW um, that's upcoming, and then the local steering committee of ICARP-5, which will be in Boulder, so. Thank you, Darcy. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good afternoon. Long uh, my name is Darcy Peter Koyakon in Gwich'in Athabaskan from Beaver, Alaska. Uh, I work now um, from the homelands of the Diné people, the Lower Tana River uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska. I am the adaptation lead for Permafrost Pathways, a project hosted under Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, what brings me to IPY5 in this meeting um, is I'm an ind indigenous scientist. I recently relapsed back into science uh, last week, actually. I was um, practicing science for my first couple years post-grad, um, took a break to do some project management stuff, uh, still with tribes and nonprofits um, in the state. And now I'm back at Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, and I think I uh, have seen a lot of good and bad done in the scientific community uh, when it comes to working or attempting to work with ind indigenous communities. Masit Cho, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Yeah, um, I'm Rachel Alok Daniel, and I'm Yupik from Tuliak, Alaska. And um, what brings me into this space is that um, I have had experience from the academic, the agency, and the community perspectives. Um, in research management and policy. Um, and I am currently um, self-employed. So I'm calling in today from the Anishinaabe homelands on the shores of, northern shores of Lake Superior. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a pleasure um, to have all four of you here and contributing. And we'll chat through a number of different questions. Um, and then we'll open up, we'll have questions from Polar Research Board members. And if there's time, also other people who are um, participants in listening today. Um, there's not a particular order for addressing these questions, and we want to make sure all of you have a chance to chime in in areas that you want to, um, but don't feel like you can't, you know, jump back to something or bring, bring things up or um, uh, go, go around a little more popcorn style as we address these. So the first thing that um, we're wondering is um, your perspectives on what meaningful Indigenous leadership and engagement in IPY looks like, and are there recent activities that might serve as a model? And I would say feel free to unmute yourself and chime in probably as we're working on these, it's um, fine to do that rather than raise questions amongst the panelists. Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, recently, we were over at um, ASSW in Edinburgh, Scotland. There was a, a few of us over there and we were talking about ICARP. Um, 
uh, one thing that they recently did is they um, uh, created a space for an indigenous co-chair. And so Daily Sambo Duro will be the, the co-chair to kind of help with the, the planning of ICARP 5. And um, I think that was a, a really big step um, and something I'd like to see see more of. Um, could I share my one slide at this point? Yeah, share access, I do. Um, so I, in kind of my role with ICARP and kind of thinking about these different aspects and these different concepts, like what is indigenous led versus indigenous leadership, I started, um, yeah, I think there's kind of a big difference between when you're talking about indigenous peoples, such as sovereigns, and in the US, it'd be tribes. Um, in other countries, since it's international, it'd be different different types of structure gov and governance. Um, I think that's different than thinking about how we support those groups from leading versus supporting indigenous scholarship and indigenous academics. Um, both are important, but I think they're a bit different. And so any kind of my role with ICARP and a lot of kind of the work I've been doing recently is really supporting indigenous led research. And so I created the scale of thinking about indigenous self-determination. And so on the far right, kind of what I'm working towards and helping support to happen is projects and programs that's for us, by us, for indigenous people, such as something more specific than indigenous led, be like Inupiat led would be an example. So it's led by communities, led by the tribe, for tribal members, they can use indigenous methodology. So it could be something, say, completely in the Inupiat knowledge system and language, or it could be co-produce, co-production of knowledge, and they um, partner with researchers to answer questions around climate change or contamination or things like that that they have that um, is really important for their community as well as generally important for the broader Nordic research community and then kind of stepping down from there is where co-production knowledge sits is the next step down which is co-leading something project having that shared decision making and the next step down is having digital representatives in this dominant system where generally there is advisory and some decision making power but it's not something that i would consider indigenous led it's really still in that dominant paradigm and then there's consultation the formal consultation process is so something nsf has just put out for their new PAPG, um, those types of things. And so decision making though is still retained by the dominant system, even though through their duty consult consultation. And then kind of the first step in this is informed, which is just input from indigenous peoples. And so for ICARP, kind of where um, I see the only real potential is to do informed. And that's something I'd like to see going future for IPY because ICARP is happening now and um, it's next year is really that's kind of the only thing that we can do is informed having more input from indigenous peoples into that process. And that's something I like to just be like, again, like this little initial stepping stone towards something that's farther along the scale for IPY. That's an amazing visual, Margaret. Um, and yeah, we have to work more together in the future so I can not steal it, but um, yeah, <laughs> so I can reference it more. Um, yeah, so for me, I think, obviously agree with everything James and Margaret said, um, but yeah, I think it's having, it's more than just having the right people in the right spaces. It's creating an environment um, for them to feel comfortable to share their experiences and perspectives, um, at least in that first step. Um, of you know have uh, of including indigenous knowledge um so it, it it takes a lot of work um i think on uh the researchers end and on the non-indigenous people's end to make that space comfortable um but yeah just to throw that in there with in addition to what margaret and james said um yeah i totally appreciate everything shared so far um, and agree with everyone. Um, one thing that 
I noticed in the um, concept paper was that it was quite vague about defining what indigenous leadership and engagement um, meant, right? And I think that's okay because I feel like that then gives space because I feel like indigenous people should be deciding how that's defined. Um, and um, so right off the top of my head, I can see like, you know, I think, you know, what both um, uh, Margaret and Darcy were talking about, you, um, I can see four, you know, categories and rights holders, right? It's critical to engage early and at the appropriate level. Um, you know, and internationally, a partner could be the permanent participants through the Arctic Council. And in the U.S., um, Margaret mentioned uh, the government-to-government -government relationship um, that um, the government holds with tribes. Um, and there's existing guidance and protocols there. Then number two, I think, is indigenous knowledge and expert knowledge holders um, that should be goodly included. And I feel like there's guidance that exists and authored by rights holders as well. And two examples, I think um, ICC is one and Quark is the other. I think Julie is online um, and can speak to that as well. Um, then number three is like indigenous scientists, indigenous academics, indigenous scholars. So there's the need for, um, you know, including um, um, Indigenous scholars um, early on. And then for Indigenous communities that should be engaged in a culturally appropriate approach. Before we move to the next question, are there any other examples that any of you want to raise up as far as um, model activities or um, items under this sort of seeing improvements is moving along that spectrum that Margaret shared? I think going back to like co-production origin, and then Rachel's co-authored a wonderful paper on co-production knowledge. I think there's a lot in there in that sense. And I think I go back to um, visionality and that's something that you see more often in social science and not so much in the natural science. And that's something for my work in ICARP has been thinking about how we make this process more transparent than it has been um, in the decision-making in where the biases come in and having kind of that broader discussion so you kind of understand where you're at and yeah just kind of like that aspect of where you're at in the spectrum what can you do to do better and just stuff like that and kind of having that self-awareness I think is really crucial and that's something one reason why I created that was because I feel like I'm an indigenous academic I'm not representing indigenous people I just want to like that's my positionality yeah, I think one more example to maybe keep our eyes on is the Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledge and Science. And I think earlier, I think Julie Brigham Gretty maybe mentioned that. But um, just being at one of their meetings recently, they really did create a space that was very welcoming to Indigenous people. And it is an Indigenous-led effort, so that, that kind of that fits. But looking for opportunities to support more indigenous led centers like this, I think will really help change the atmosphere that we're all working in. Thanks. Um, thinking about that we are IPY5 planning, getting started earlier than before, which seems like it has many, many benefits. Um, so, 
when you think about kind of next steps, um, what steps are you thinking might be taken in the near term um, to help ensure that Indigenous knowledge and perspectives are brought into IPY5 planning and implementation? We did hear a note this morning, and I'm not remembering exactly what it was called, but at one of the tasks, task forces for IPY5 focusing on Indigenous participation. So that's one element we heard of. But um, certainly, I think there's probably a lot of other opportunities and possibilities. Um, and looking forward to your thoughts on that. So I have a, a couple ideas. I think that um, engagement is critical um, for scientists to engage with um, community leaders. Um, there's opportunities through the ICC. There's also opportunities through AFN, but to really listen to the concerns of the community members. Um, I think applied research is very helpful in the arctic when things are changing as fast as they are to listen to the concerns of the community leaders and then research those areas um i think with limited resources to fund research it's it's critical to really focus on the needs of the communities and i think that's something we can do right now So Margaret mentioned that IK is all about relationality and I totally agreed. And I think that was one of my points here, right? It's holistic, it's um, interconnected and most importantly connected to people. So um, earlier I mentioned right, the importance of engaging rights holders and appropriately engaging the knowledge holders, um, holders of that knowledge. Um, so I think um, similar to James, I think it's really critical to create and strengthen um, your relationships with indigenous peoples and understanding that lay of the land um, and how indigenous pe you know, peoples um, like see themselves and in society. And so um, I, I think you should be creating space in the leadership of IPY with, um, you know, you know, starting off since this is an academic space, start off with indigenous scholars and academics and maybe even think about, okay, like, you know, can we get like, create like some um, circle of leaders that come from different sectors of indigenous um, communities. So um, um, that they're able to, uh, you know, help define, okay, what does indigenous peoples mean? Yeah, a million percent agree with what James and Michelle said. Um, I think in terms of next steps, like it's, I think it requires just a lot of like personal buy-in um, when investing in indigenous knowledge holders and indigenous peoples. Um, yeah, agree completely with what Margaret said um, during the last question about like how you view yourself, right? Like I'm just a dirty booger native girl who so happens to have a higher degree so I can fill these spaces, right? But I don't think I like represent the people from my region. Uh, I think there are elders and um, youth who live in the communities that know way more than me. Um, but that being said, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, but going along with what James said, immersing yourself in Alaska, at least, or in other communities or other states, countries, uh, by the polls, like, is really, really, really important. Um, because the way that Alaska operates is very different than the way that the rest of the world operates. And I'm a firm believer in that. Um, every decision directly impacts our people. Um, and they're often left out of conversations. Um, so yeah, I, I think immersing yourself in um, understanding how things work, at least in Alaska, in terms of indigenous peoples. I mean, there are a lot of conferences um, Alaska Federation of Natives, Alaska Tribal Conference of Environmental Management. I mean, there's there's a lot of things you can go to and just interact with Indigenous peoples, hear from them, go to sessions about their different, um, you know, concerns that they have uh, in terms of climate change and uh, the way that research is done. So yeah, just want to 
add that in there as well. I think um, kind of adding to this, and this was said already this morning, is capacity to do this work. Um, having actually like positions and funding for especially community leaders to participate would be really crucial at this step in aligning that I think is really, it's going to be a limiting factor. Um, and that's something where the model of volunteerism is not going to work um, for this in the sense that like my role in ICARP is volunteerism because I can leverage my salary at UAF under service to participate in that versus people representing indigenous communities or NGOs, they don't have that aspect. And I think it'd be really crucial to have funding to have capacity at that level uh, starting now would be really crucial for success. Yeah, and that can also be written into policy, which is something that you know could be part of um, ICARP. You know, looking at the policies and where do they support Indigenous scholars and honor Indigenous knowledge? I would love to ask a follow up question for you all. So, in order to carry out some of these steps forward, it requires some knowledge of, of tribal governance and pathways of communication within different tribal communities. So, I would ask all of you. What do you think people should know? This is a big question about tribal governance and tribal communication and what to expect when building relationships with tribal communities. I can start it off. Um, yeah, so at least in my experience, being having a foot in both worlds, right? Being a researcher and being indigenous, I am extremely comfortable with like, long pauses and silences and not filling a space. Um, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier about creating a space where people feel uh, comfortable. Um, a lot of Indigenous folks, at least in my region, and I think in most regions, like are approached often by people who are outsiders and want to come in and work with them and X, Y, Z. Um, and it yeah, it, so in terms of what to expect, um, it's really different, I think, community by community uh, and region by region. Um, but there are trainings out there that exist. Um, I know Native Movement has a lot of trainings. Um, First Alaskans Institute has a lot of trainings. Um, I'm not sure of any that are um, super focused on like working in a scientific way with Indigenous communities, but they do give good overviews of what, um, yeah, like how just a very general experience of indigenous peoples in Alaska. Um, so I just thought I'd share that. Yeah, and I think Kuwerik just came out with um, some guidance and protocols for working with indigenous communities in their region. And so that's also really helpful as a tool for researchers. Um, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, you go ahead, Rachel. Um, I was just gonna add to the, um, you know, the training piece. Um, and for the training piece, I think it's also important to understand the history and culture, right? And why there are tribes and why, and what sovereignty is and what that means. And so I think the training should also focus on those things. Um, and then I was gonna add, I think the Polar Research Board has, uh, expert on this with Adelaide Herman and that sense of the like the life of the tribe and their experiences as well as like the fiscal pathways um, for tribes and for communities that's something she does research on so you guys have that already there but I think I'd add um, just it there's like an expectation in like co-production of knowledge and in trying to work with communities is that it's the communities that adapt to science and the science community, the way they talk and the way they work and things like that, that's the expectation. And I think a lot of that has to do with researchers not really understanding what it's like to be um, in an indigenous community or working for a tribe and those aspects. But I think there really needs to kind of be that 
push if you're going to work with the community to really understand what's important to them, how they make decisions and things like that. And so really putting in that effort and that legwork to understand what's important to them, I think is really crucial. And I think that's the same for IPY. And that's kind of where the, I really push the language of supporting indigenous led research um, versus really kind of centering science continually. And I think to build on what Margaret said on more of a local level, um, when you get to know communities, they're already doing a lot of work. And so where can you add your strengths and your um, uh, capacity to build on what they're already doing? All right, as so we've it's already come up a little bit here, kind of, and also just thinking about the indigenous led components um versus you know other efforts that are going to be happening. And where we'd love to get your perspectives on kind of what is this Venn diagram perhaps composed of that are um, steps undertaken um, by indigenous people, um, steps that allies should undertake and the areas for, you know, the most overlap as well. Um, well, I guess I'll start. Out. There is, already a group being led by Daly Salvadoro. James already mentioned it, but she's been really doing um, community building and things like that and those aspects to indigenous art of research. And so I think it's really important to kind of continue those efforts, um, expand upon them. You know, obviously Daly can't do it all. It's going to take several people to do that kind of support system to bring people together in a way that's indigenous and inclusive. I think that'd be really important. And there's also, there's other people involved in that project, including some folks in the room I saw earlier, but yeah. I just dropped a um, article in the, in the chat and I really like, um, uh, this article, Moving Beyond Ontological Worldview Supremacy, Indigenous Insights, and a Recovery Guide for Sett Settler Colonial Scientists. And so in this article, there are actual steps out, kind of laid out on what different roles different people can play. Um, and so one that, one that I really like is that um, institutions can support interactions between indigenous people and indigenous scientists. And so creating those spaces, I think is really important. And I think um, one thing that Margaret said now, and I was gonna mention earlier on the first question that I think, you know, is key is like support, right? And I think allies can offer that support and, um, you know, to have meaningful indigenous leadership and engagement. And so I would um, challenge folks in the room to think about what that means and to think about your own experiences and what did it take for me to get here and, you know, think about my training, my knowledge attainment, what tools do I use in my job? Um, do I have administrative support? Um, what's my finance department look like? Do I have a finance department? Am I compensated for my time? So all those things that support you as a scientist or an agency person and to like think about what that might take to support indigenous peoples to um, thrive in this space. Also, another thing that I, I really get excited about is as indigenous people, like we see the world in a very holistic um, way. And that is, that means including indigenous philosophers, indigenous artists in these conversations, not just scientists 
or knowledge holders, but our whole communities. And I think that's something that's really exciting and um, can really, you know, challenge the Western way of doing things. And I think that's something that um, is, would be really neat to see in the future. Okay. Yeah. Have... And I think there's tangible things as well. Um, not just ontological or epistemological, but in a sense that there's really great uh, indigenous led um, things going from the community level um, by both the, the tribe and also people that work for tribes or for indigenous NGOs. Um, you know, I lead community St. Paul Islands doing great work. Work, um, talks of you, like there's just so many out there, um, and it's just kind of again like those should be centered as like real leaders in this in IPY, um, and they're really tangible. It's not about like reinventing the wheel or thinking that Indigenous people are really behind in this. You know they are really part of the Arctic research community, and I think I get it get a little bit annoyed when I see the narrative that they're stakeholders or they're somehow outside the Arctic research team like but they are doing Arctic research how are they not part of the Arctic research community I have another bonus question for all of you <laughs> um so we've been talking obviously a lot about the Arctic what role do you think U.S. Indigenous leadership communities should play in supporting indigenous leadership in Antarctica? I think it's the same way, like indigenous people get involved in Arctic research, like yes, they might not be living in Antarctica, but climate change is really impacting indigenous communities. And I think that's something really important. Like that's why they have a stake in it um, and why it's important to them. And I think supporting that, and I think that's something I'd like to do is to really, um, yeah, kind of do more of that relationship building between the two poles would be really great. I know that the Maori are um, they're moving towards also being more included in the Antarctica research planning. And so I think having some exchanges or some dialogues on kind of what each are doing and how we can learn from each other, I think would be really great. I agree. I think more opportunity um, to engage because we are impacted by it. You know, the sea level rise is real. Um, and then to think about um, our, our, our kin, the whale, they travel you know, from the south to the north. And so these things all, it's very interconnected and they do connect us to um, Antarctica. And so I would really support working with, you know, the indigenous folks, the Maori in New Zealand. I think they're doing a lot of really good work. And so looking to build those relationships. I also think that um, maybe there's also um, um, misconception that indigenous peoples are not connected, um, you know, to the Antarctica. And I think James just gave a great example, right, of a connection. And I feel like there's the need, you know, to look towards those connections because, um, you know, ourselves, in general have, you know, had challenges in the past that we've gradually overcome. Like for example, um, you know, in the Bering Sea, oceanography, ocean currents, um, like fisheries knowledge um, and the central Arctic ocean as well. And so there have been those misconceptions there and, you know, the like scientific community in those spaces are gradually understanding, hey, okay, indigenous peoples have a connection and 
now knowledge about like some of those dynamics. So it's being open to that concept of connectivity, I think. Maybe we'll turn to our last kind of pre-prepared question topic, um, which is really sharing on your perspective of what a successful IPY5 looks like for Arctic Indigenous peoples. Um, and again, feel we recognize this is your perspective as an individual. You're not meant to to speak for all indigenous people or even you know a particular group. But what do what do you think this could look like um, as far as envisioning success? I think looking at um, the past AOSs and they just there's always this continued call for systemic change to happen. And I think that's kind of what success looks like to me is really sustained change, sustained indigenous leadership, sustained relationships past just like a, this discrete event that's IPI. Um, you know, something that like where you can really look at, you know, who's, you know, what there was talk about from the previous IPI and women and that's example, but I think then you know, what's the next step would be something that's even more diverse, looking at Indigenous people, all those different types of metrics, and that there is sustained change in who's doing research and who's in Arctic research and considers themselves part of Arctic research, I think would be, to me, what success is. Yeah, and to build off of what you said too, Margaret, um, I think going from that, uh, beautiful PowerPoint slide you showed, right? Like starting from the left side and going to the right. And that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of funding, um, a lot of personal buy-in. Um, so I think that would be a successful IPY5, right? Is if all the projects um, eventually at some point in time uh, would be indigenous led um, by the people for the people. Um, yeah, it's more of a broader I think success, but I mean, I think it's good to keep in mind during these conversations. And I, I agree with both Margaret and Darcy. Um, one thing that I think that I really value is applied research. And so just using all the resources, I mean, there's, there's limited resources, but there's still a lot of resources that can really impact and have a, a positive change to assisting communities um, in the Arctic as we face climate change. I think that is, um, it's it's important that we all work together and um, I would love to see more applied research and coordination. And so that coordination can even look like coordinating with the Denali Commission or Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Um, organizations that are already working on these issues. But if scientists um, in our individual research projects would you know, come alongside and kind of help support as well, I think we could see a really big, a big change. And I wanna um, go back to the conceptual note. Um, I, I noticed um, <clears throat> that actionable science as a being important for meeting community needs was highlighted several times. And um, I would say that it's not just actionable science, um, be, that implies like Western needs, but also, you know, for just actionable knowledge because that more effortlessly includes indigenous knowledge and in indigenous perspectives because some of the like um, knowledge about that's necessary for cultural bearers, for speakers, for um, you know expert knowledge holders, um, and and because this is you know due to the changing Arctic, all of those things are going to be changing, um, not just the environment, and so um, all of those things 
are also connected in this holistic view to the like environment. And so it's important to think about uh, the interconnectedness there and to be open to, um, you know, what knowledge is needed to take action, whether, you know, like I said, it's for, um, you know, determining language or, you know, um, whether it's for, um, you know, subsistence practices. Um, it's, again, like folks said before me, like the community should be a part of making, you know, those decisions about what that might be. I think thinking about what kind of Rachel just said, um, yeah, just really recognizing um, indigenous knowledge and just methodologies as research would be something that I think would be a huge success coming at IPY. Um, and then I think, you know, what are some models out there? Can I return to that first question? I think the Guardians program out of Canada is a good model to start maybe looking at in what could be uh, something in Alaska. And I know that's also something that's currently being explored happening in Alaska, but I think kind of that model is just like having that support for um, Indigenous knowledge for those folks and kind of really honoring that, that that's a real, yeah, lost for words of how to express that in like a real meaningful way. But like, yeah, I think that'd be really crucial. One of the things I'm interested too is um, the the thinking about kind of a success, not just not just on that input side, but that output side. And for example, in the earlier today, we were hearing also, you know, engage the parts of engagement and outputs and activities of IPY that aren't just about the research like kind of the research or the science questions, um, but also just a very broad sort of education and outreach space. Um, and admittedly in my brain, I felt a little bit immediately concerned that they sort of had like an indigenous task force rather than sort of like a indigenous peoples on all of their task force, which would include their education space. But um, I'd be curious for your perspectives on success that has this other kind of form of engagement um, that is part of what creating an international polar year is about. Um, and maybe James, I might point to you to, to address this first, since I know that you think about these things on the daily too. Yeah, I, I think there's many ways that we can uplift our community and engagements, one of those, but also the way that we communicate um, and looking at the inclusion of indigenous knowledge in the material. I think our language is, is you know, so valuable when talking about the environment, when de describing the environment. And it is a priority of many indigenous communities to kind of support their language programs. And I think if we're looking to engage with elders, with folks that, you know, um, English may not be their first language to um, incorporate things and translate them into indigenous languages is a really cool opportunity. Yeah, to add on that too, that's a really, really, really good point, James, because I think about this on a daily basis too, like how to communicate with Indigenous peoples. And yes, English for a lot of people is not their first language. Um, and so when you publish a scientific paper, it's filled with a bunch of lingo and a bunch of terms that like I sometimes can't even understand it as a scientist if it's not my realm of science. Like it's really thinking about how to communicate. And in terms of IPY5, like a success maybe would be like having a more in-depth um, outreach portion of, you know, projects or proposals um, that would be like low hanging fruit in, in my, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, more than just 
writing a paper. I got the check from a tribe somewhat nearby my research page and then publishing a paper that no one's ever going to see um, from the community. So really, yeah. And that's where the applied research that James was talking about really comes into handy because I'm a firm believer that if your research doesn't come back to people in the region, then like, what good is it um, at some point, right? Like um, it's science for the sake of science. Um, I think there's been a lot of that in the past and I think it's time to change that. Um, so yeah, definitely hiring translators, paying them for their time, paying indigenous knowledge holders for their time, writing it in the budget, not just going somewhere, um, for a couple of days and then leaving, right. To do your science, like actually spending time in the community, hosting a community meeting, um, having no agenda, um, and there are planning grants for, for, for that. So there's a lot of recommendations and different ways to do science, I think, that can be incorporated in IPY5. Um, but those are just a few, um, yeah, a few of my thoughts. Um, I think, you know, yeah, the words aren't even used like applied science, actual science, or use-inspired research is like the current buzzword for this. Um, but I really like the using the language of really doing research to meet community priorities and just kind of explicitly laying out. And that's something looking at like the end of day critique letters, you know, it's something they really call for is a sense of that aspect. And also to like, it is quite different than just doing um, science based on curiosity or innovation and things like that. Um, but really kind of having that use inspired research or science and those elements and really kind of beating community priorities. And I think that then circles back to me like indigenous led research. Also going back to the conceptual note, um, there are a broad set of principles that are listed and as I read them, I, you know, I get excited. I'm like, yeah, oh, totally. I agree with that. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I think that, you know, it's, you know, you know, ensuring that, um, I'm, I'm not sure how, if you thought how you're going to follow through that these principles are applied, you know, throughout IPY, um, you know, or if, you know, how you're going to ensure that um, Indigenous um, leadership and engagement um, will be a part of, you know, the different set of principles. Um, but that would be one thing, you know, to think about so that, like, it's not just having, okay, we're going to, you know, this, this checkbox, this is how we're meeting our Indigenous engagement you know, it's through this, we, you know, have this one deliverable. So, so it's trying to think about how, um, you know, um, the pieces of IPY are connected so that, you know, you can trace um, how they might relate to people and not just that, but also having the PIs under, on, or the investigators under, you know, that section of IPY, also understand how their work relates, you know, to these outcomes. So one other thing, the thought that I had is, you know, when uh, I like to ask, you know, kind of what's changing, but then also what's not changing. And I think in these types of conversations, we see a lot of like movement in really good directions, but maybe the pieces that aren't changing are the policies or the funding. And so I think to make a big, you know, systemic move, all the pieces need to change. And so I think that's just something to be, to keep in mind as we look to, to create these changes. Okay, so I think we'll move on to questions from um, first from Polar Research Board members and then from everyone. Okay. 
So uh, this is Anupma Prakash, and I have a question. Um, so in the next IPY, when you're envisioning the IPY5, where uh, we want to see IPY, uh, indigenous-led research, we, we want to see also a lot of research that is in the polar regions uh, getting funded and getting supported in larger projects. How, how do we ensure that the indigenous communities not only leading or represented but also is protected in the sense that there is no burnout or overtapping. I think burnout happens when you are having to continually react to what other people want versus really kind of leading from what you want and what your community wants. Um, Cause then basically you're just, again, you're, reacting quite often what happens that you repeat yourself over and over and over and over again. I think a lot of us who are indigenous these spaces or who work for tribes get, that's that's to me burnout. Like I just had my conference circuit this spring and I was so burnt out by the end of it because I was just saying the same thing over and over again. And I see this also as some people saying the same thing over and over again. And we actually have conversations about like tapping out and tapping in someone else to kind of do it for a while. Just because it is just like, and like some of it, yeah, it's kind of necessary because you're all constantly onboarding new people into this and those aspects. But it's just like, it's it's so much more healing and those aspects when you're really doing something that's very like indigenous um, for your community in relation, like that's what kind of makes it worth it. Um, and so I think that's, again, just really centering to have that happen and having actually funding calls that are really about that, I think would be really important. I think also respecting their decision to participate or to not participate. I think that's really important. Um, if they choose to participate, they want to, they're going to be involved. But if it's a decision that maybe they're they feel forced to or like there's not an option then that i think is is not a good sign but just respecting their decision and i think planning ahead is also you know an important element of that because um i think all too often um researchers you know um and the government come to communities um you know, at the end or at the last minute, already after they have made up their mind about a project and are inviting people to join on. Um, or when they know what, okay, this is what this decision is about rather than at the beginning. And I think a benefit of, you know, what I understand that you're doing is that you're starting at more of the beginning. And so this gives you an opportunity to like, you know, identify the spaces where um, Indigenous peoples gather, what the leadership structure is, um, and identify like who to reach out to so that you're planning in, in advance so that you don't get to that point. Um, and um, I, I think that's the beauty of engaging early. Agree with all of everything you guys said. And that's a great question too. Um, it's a very thoughtful question. Um, yeah, I think to avoid burnout, it's yeah, respecting their decision, engaging early and often. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's everything, right? I mean, it's ensuring that their voices are valued. Um, indigenous people have a different value system than, um, researchers and just realizing the difference in that value system, I think is really important and can put you light years ahead. Um, because I think it's easy once you somewhat understand, uh, their value system, then you can understand how to avoid burnout. Right. And what might be too much, um, what might not be enough, um, not asking too much. And then if you engage early and often, then you can identify the expectations as well. Right. Like this is what, like, before I do anything, right? I'm like, 
what do you want from me? Right. I mean, who else is going to be there? What's the audience? Um, are the indigenous folks being paid for their time? Like I have my own certain like vetting process to protect myself because I am getting, I am getting a lot of requests. Like Margaret said, we do have to defer to other people sometimes if we're like, I don't have the capacity. Um, but yeah, it's, that's a really good question and thank you for asking it. But yeah, agree a hundred percent with what James, Margaret and Rachel said. One, one thing I might add to that too is respecting their timeline. I think communities operate on different timelines. There's subsistence seasons. And if, if you're needing to do all your research in the summer when nobody's there and nobody's, if you're bringing somebody into the project that would rather or needs to be out gathering or hunting, I think that that's, you know, an impact that is really, really um can cause burnout because they don't want to be there. And so respecting their timelines, I think is really important. Okay, let's, well, we have two minutes. So let's go with Julie and then Adelheid. And those will be our last questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks to the panelists for everything you've shared so far. Um, I'll, I'll keep it quick and ask if there is anything specific or what specific things uh, panelists think the IPY planning committee should be doing right now in terms of engagement, outreach, um, and other work with indigenous communities and organizations. I think seeking that funding is crucial to have capacity to do this work, as well as capacity to work on these different planning um, committees and things like that, and then working with funding agencies, you know, building off what the first panel said to really create um, calls that uh, would support indigenous research and um, co production. Work. I agree with the funding and like funding, like funding commitments right away, right? And is crucial. And then training, um, off like creating some sort of training um, on history, culture, and working with um, communities. And and I I want to clarify. We actually we do have until half after, so we do have thirty more minutes to have this discussion. Don't feel that you need to be in a, in a rush. And we definitely have um, time for uh, the remaining questions online and in the room, and probably more that will come up. Yes, please queue up your questions. Sorry for the confusion. I still have the old agenda in my brain. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Julie. I I think that there's often opportunities to include Indigenous folks on leadership panels and in leadership positions. And so, um, and we saw that with I, uh, ICARP as they have a co-chair that's Indigenous. And so I think looking for opportunities to, to really include Indigenous people on um, in positions of leadership. And then Lauren, I might let you, you can probably see who in the room has a hand up too. So I might let you decide about back and forth between online and in the room. Okay, let's go with Adelheid. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks to the panel for um, this presentation. I hope that um, all of you can stay involved in the um, work that we're doing on the Polar Research Board. And just to mention that, um, I think you guys have sold yourself a little bit short. I think with your lived experience that, you know, that you um, paved the way for a lot of people in this space and the work that you're doing has, um, has really been uh, phenomenal I, um, in doing this work. One of the things I wanted to mention is um, about, you know, you talked about your exhaustion in your work, but also, um, oh, Maybe you could mention a little bit about the um, the capacity at the local or tribal level that how exhausting that is for people. Um, you know, just in general with the work now, and if they're going to do the uh, indigenous, I mean not indigenous, 
uh, <laughs> older year, um, that, you know, there's going to be more um, it, the tribes and uh, individuals are going to be taxed more to to do this work. So I thought you made everybody made a lot of good points, and I'll try to um, bring those points forward in the future when we're planning uh, this work. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's good to see you, Adelheid. Um, yeah. So in terms of, I mean, this is just going to be my experience, um, but burnout <laughs> certain in like indigenous communities, um, I think relates back to what James said about respecting timelines. Uh, we are a holistic people. We view the world holistically. Um, we're in tune with the land and we are a part of the land and we very much so live our life by the seasons, right? Like in the summer, we fish, in the fall, we hunt, in the winter, we trap, in the spring, we hunt, right? I, I mean, we we live in uh, unison with the environment. And so, I mean, a lot of people ask me um, all the time, like what would be the best time for to do X, Y, Z or to come out or to do this or for you to travel or attend this and that. And I mean, it really depends community by community, right? I mean, in my region, we live a different we live our months differently than people say in the Yukon Cuscoquim Delta, right? So um, yeah, I think in terms of burnout, it's um, a lot of communities that I've worked with and in my community and in my region haven't even left the state. Um, so it can be very exhausting to ask them to go to like Washington DC or to go to North Pacific Fishery Management Council and to go and fill these spaces where there isn't a comfortability in how they operate. Like it's like going and playing a game, right? And you don't know the rules. You don't know like what the goal is, but you're just there and you left your community, right? And you're in this space and um, your voice isn't being heard. And that's unfortunately how I myself got into this role. Like, it's just like, wow, it's absolutely overwhelming. And I, on the flip side, I see that as a privilege um, because I do have a higher education uh, degree, like I have the capacity and the privilege of filling these spaces, but um, I most of the time am, am the wrong person. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish like my uncle from the community would come and speak about this. Right. Or um, so anyways, in terms of burnout in the communities, um, you're asking them to leave their families. Right. And you're asking them to take a step away from their job, um, their paid job to do something. Uh, and that's why the funding that Margaret brought up is so, so, so important um, to pay people for their time, for their perspectives. I mean, yeah, it's it's really, um, it can be really exhausting. Um, so that's a good uh, question and a good thing for us to raise Adelheid um, in this space. Yeah. I agree with Darcy, sorry. <laughs> no, I have a couple thoughts too. And I think, you know, um, trainings for researchers can can really help. Um, there was one instance that um, I think is just a great example of um, a project that was working in a community in the YK, and they were really interested in water and sanitation work. And so they were going to go around and do a whole community-wide survey. They met with the tribe and talked with the environmental program director there. And he was like, I have to do a survey for my job. So why don't we combine forces? And so they did a combined survey. And so that's a really good example of, you know, researchers coming in, bringing capacity and assisting a tribe and or a village, a community and collecting the data that they needed. But it also gave, you know, the researcher information for their project. And so I think those like collaborative efforts can be really, really beneficial. And so providing training that, you know, introduces these types of collaborations to researchers to look for these when they're out in communities, I think is, is a good, a good place to start. And um, back to Darcy's point, I, I, um, totally agree that, um, you know, oftentimes, um, whether it's researchers or, you know, 
resource agencies or policy makers, um, folks or request um, tribe members, elders, um, leaders, hunters to travel, right? And so it's 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 you know a system that is built and comes from um, you know how you know the outside world is used to doing business, right? So um, I think it's, you know, by planning in, in advance, you can think about these other like tools that, hey, maybe we can get someone who might not be like healthy to travel, but is the right person to talk on this topic. So accommodating and identifying what those means of engagement and communication are is critically important as well, I think. Um, and Adelaide, you kind of made me think about something. So I am one of the things I research for my research on co-production knowledge is the concept of boundary spanners, which are people who are community leaders or indigenous academics or people who official liaison roles. And just the sense that you get called to all these different meetings and you get, you're get you running around every which way. And so that does feel like progress, but when you kind of look at the bigger thing, bigger picture, is that quite often it isn't. And I think that was something we kind of talked about in the sense that boundary spanners can enable boundaries, can enable those separations from ha like staying in place and how quite often people who are want to be comfortable and not uncomfortable, they don't want to go to the community or make accommodations, like we enable them not to. By, uh, by like trying to get people to come into more of the dominant system versus dominant system adapting towards those community people. And I think that's kind of was a hard discussion we had in our group about boundary spanners that I thought was really important um, in the sense that it's really like everyone's responsibility to do boundary spanning, to do that accommodation. Um, and I think that's kind of a really important um, kind of concept to bring forward to IPY is that it's going to have to look different. We will go to Deneb and then we will go to Ross. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Deneb and I am the US delegate to SCAR and I'm also the SCAR vice president for science. And in that capacity as vice president for science, um, I did attend an early IPY planning meeting and Andre, you were there. It was in May of 2021. And I have to say after listening to this morning and this afternoon, and I really thank all the speakers and panelists because I, I've got a much bigger perspective now on things, but one of the things that seems to be missing from the discussion is that it was really the indigenous groups, I think, that got this new idea of IPY happening in 25 years started. It wasn't science. And when we attended that meeting in 2021, there were very, there was a huge number of indigenous groups that were represented. There was only myself and Chuck Kennecott that represented the Antarctic. Um, there were a few people from IASC um, and there were no science drivers. So I think that the indigenous groups um, really were responsible um, for making this happen. And then the scientists came in afterwards. And so now we're kind of scrambling to come up with the science drivers because that's the way the funding is going to happen. So I, I think that it's important to have that perspective on it, that it really did start with the indigenous peoples looking at, at the big picture and um, really coming forward and coming together to say IPY needs to happen in 25 years, not 50 years. And so I think all of these discussions that we've been having today are really important. Um, I think that the indigenous groups have been very much involved and need to remain very much involved. And I'm hoping that the way that things get structured now that the scientists have come in with IASC and SCAR organizing, um, kind of all the different groups that, that indigenous peoples are gonna stay involved. And I know that, that this is something that we are working for and we want to make sure that that happens. But I just want to mention that from my perspective, being involved you know, back from 2021, it, it's really um, important to, to take a look at how this all came about.
And Andre, you might have a different perspective on it, but that's how I see it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's correct. I mean, the the, the notion was that uh, the, the discussion started and they were including indigenous people's organizations from the very beginning. That's exactly the case. And and that's why I guess the shaping of the IPY five is different. Uh, but I mean, it was Ayaska, Yasa, Uartic, and indigenous people, mostly permanent participants, who kind of were in the very beginning, and then then it all came from there. So, but you are you are right. It's really involving indigenous people's organizations from the start. I also wanted to give a shout out to Margaret. Maybe she could talk about what IPY as indigenous polar year may look like, huh? <laughs> Or maybe talk about this quick, quick idea. Um, well, I believe, Andre, the Indigenous Polar Year is your idea. I just created this logo and this button. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of really honoring the fact that Indigenous people are really side essential to this, they're the right holders, and just kind of this a little bit of rebranding that it should be Indigenous Polar Year. But I think, too, we kind of covered a lot on what it should look like. but. I don't know if you had a more specific question. Okay, Ross. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Ross Virginia, PRB. Uh, I'm at Dartmouth College. And yeah, I've been, this has been a great discussion. Thank you everyone for your for your sharing and your knowledge and uh, the ideas that you've already planted. I have three pages of notes here. And so, um, but a couple of things I was thinking about. One is undoubtedly that IPY should become thought of very widely as indigenous people's year, just as Margaret put forward. Um, so that I think is actually a pretty interesting planning goal in, in, in many ways, thinking about what that is. And if you think about IPY also as international polar year, um, how do we think about a couple of things? One is how does a PRB come to Alaska, become become known in Alaska to Alaskans and to learn more from people in Alaska about how the PRB and other institutions that are kind of sitting away in DC, you know, what is it we do and what do we care about? And and uh, how how do we how do we share in a better future for everyone? So um, that's something I think we've talked about a little bit in PRB, but I, I think that this idea that we should be going north and not expecting everyone to show up in our space is really central. And, and Rochelle brought that up just a couple of minutes ago. Um, the other is the international side. So there's there, you know, there are indigenous communities across the Arctic and in many different places with different histories and cultures and languages and context seems to me that the IPY is also a really important opportunity for knowledge sharing and capacity building and sharing resources across these communities um, and finding ways to fund and facilitate and um, um, empower th those groups to, to drive that agenda. Um, I don't pretend to know what it might be, but I think that that sort of knitting together the international aspects along with what uh, PRB as a U.S. national committee can do, bridging those is, is going to be really a challenging, but really, I think, essential opportunity. So I just sort of wanted to share that and maybe particularly how, how can the PRB become more directly engaged in the space of the U.S. Arctic? Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll jump in first. Um, yeah, I think immersing yourself in Alaska, right, is the first thing. Um, maybe having a booth at AFN or ATCHEM or AMSS or any of the A's uh, that happened in Alaska, those conferences. There's a lot of them uh, that a lot of Indigenous people go to, uh, a lot of tribes attend, um, and just starting there, right? I mean, um, immersing yourself in Alaska. Uh, for your first question, how does IPY5 come to Alaska and get those perspectives? I mean, it's... Um, I think in terms of communicating, it should look a little bit different for Alaska, um, maybe less presentation oriented and more discussion oriented, uh, informal, uh, is always the way to go. I'm a huge fan of informal, <laughs> just being informal as a person. I mean, we're all people and we all like coffee and we all like breakfast. And so let's get coffee and breakfast together. Right. And let's do it in a room and start conversations that way. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, there's there that can look like a lot of different things. I think IPY five coming to Alaska and like including more indigenous knowledge. Um, but I think that the task force that's been um, identified, I think if I have my notes correctly with IPY five, um, yeah, I think that would be a huge success, right. Is to just attend more stuff. Um, yeah. In, in Alaska, get the information out there, um, expand your networks far and wide. Um, the more communication, the better, and the earlier, the better, uh, in terms of Alaska. So, um, yeah, just, just a few things that I think would be kind of low hanging fruit for bringing IPY5 to Alaska. I agree. I think, yeah, Arctic Encounters, AFN, but even more than just having a booth, but presenting and setting up side meetings with folks that are going to be there. I think that's really um, critical. Another thing is really look to engage with youth. I think the youth in the Arctic, there are future leaders. And um, I, I don't know if there's like a youth steering committee opportunity or, you know, we could create something like that. But I know the Arctic youth ambassadors, they're, they're really um, motivated and go-getters. But creating more opportunities like that, I think, will help spread the word. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, totally visiting, um, you know, AFN, um, um, the, um, NTHC conference, um, you know, BIA providers, if you want to reach the tribes. And so I think it depends on, you know, I, I think Darcy mentioned this earlier, who you want to reach um, and planning, you know, to attend those those different meetings, um, the like co-management, you know, meetings, um, elders youth conference before AFN, right? Because it's really great to mix the elders and youth component, right? I think, um, you know, connecting those two. And then like the academic, um, indigenous perspective might be like engaging with ANSEP. Maybe PRB has a way to engage with ANSEP um, in the future on some kind of program, maybe a program on IPY. I think kind of my comment, you know, I'm involved, people that know me and fans, Arctic Roads, and I think, you know, it's the type of thing where it's been really hard to talk about in a simple terms because at the same time, like we didn't have it fully fleshed out what we're doing yet because a lot of it was really supporting grassroots movement and being flexible and not having things set in stone until we really understand what would be the most beneficial. Um, but that's been like a continued thing because it's just like, how do you talk about something in like a real like short, concise way that's like meaningful and things like that. And then it also, I think through that process makes you really have to prioritize what you're trying to do. And those can be really hard discussions within a team, especially when you have scientists and indigenous people coming together and what do they prioritize and having those hard conversations. And I think that's probably something the PRB needs to do. Cause I think looking at least your, what PRB strikes were on your website, those are very broad. <laughs> And I'm not sure that you get a huge buy-in um, in the sense of really having people understand what you're trying to do. Okay, John did have his hand up and seconded a question in the chat. So John, either John or Twyla, would you like to ask the question but that you both share? My question was essentially, the one I was gonna ask and my hand up was answered and- um... Okay. Um, yeah, I, well, Twyla could raise that other question, but just the idea of what are the science questions from this that are more coherent across the communities that really should come up to IPY? Are they coming up through the through the indigenous communities themselves or are the questions being put to them for a response? I don't know who can answer that question for you, John. Uh, 
and for the panelists to to um, clarify related to that um, question of sort of what would it, what what does it look like for these indigenous groups to perhaps provide those science drivers too? Um, uh, Deneb was sort of describing a indigenous group motivated. IPY happening sooner, um, but then scientists coming in and devising science drivers. But the question here about, well, what about those science drivers coming from those communities? I think that would take a lot of community engagement and consultation. Um, and, you know, real leadership in folks that kind of have their foot into a those boundaries for a role um, to develop science drivers from those. Um, I think there's a lot of elements in the sense that this should be supporting Indigenous self-determination. And there could be some legworks because there's a lot of reports out there. And I think that's kind of the avenue I'm taking for ICART. But at the same time, that doesn't replace actually having Kind of those people, those leaders actually participate in developing them. Um, and I think that kind of then goes back to really needing funding for capacity to do this. I think I would also look at existing organizations that have put out priorities. I know like Kuwaric, they listed their research priorities. I know it, AFN, a lot of times they'll pass resolutions um, on specific topics, as well as like the National Congress of American Indians. They, Alaska has a good representation at their meetings. And so these are all meetings where the leaders are gathering, talking about what's impacting their communities. And so I think, um, yeah, looking at those documents and the resolutions and priorities that come out of those meetings. Martin, would you like to ask a question? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, in the late 20th century, there was an organization called the Alaska Native Science Commission. It was an Alaska Native initiative funded by the National Science Foundation for the express purpose of bringing researchers and Alaska Natives together to work together and learn together. It's been defunct for many years now. But as we look ahead to IPY and think about some of what we heard this morning about projects and programs that could serve as ramps up to the actual IPY in 32, 33, and so on, maybe thought should be given to resurrecting the Alaska Native Science Commission or maybe under some new name with a revised and improved purpose in that we're 20, 30 years later now than when the ANSC was created. But that could prove very useful, I think, from the point of view of Alaska Native and Arctic Indigenous peoples as a whole engagement in the planning and preparation and having a, an equal voice and a seat at the table for IPY5. Um, so I throw that out there as a challenge to you, I guess, to think about that, look into it, learn about it, and see how you might uh, reshape that idea into a potentially funded activity that would be very beneficial, I would think. Thanks. You know, that was a long time ago, and this is a Dennis, huh? tribal consortia, indigenous NGOs, like they're already doing a lot of work. And so then kind of push for this consortium I mean, in some ways, maybe, but it's just like, why not just work with people who are already doing the work that are doing that? Like, yeah, because again, like Indigenous-led, this 
goes back to the tribes. And I think that's always, you know, you're centering that, which is really important. And I think really kind of one aspect of getting research funds. And, you know, that could, I think you could compact that ratio level, but also if you're, if you're looking for something like huge and broad, I mean, maybe something more like statewide commission might be something, but it's also, what would that look like in that aspect, especially when we already have tribes and tribal consortia already doing great work and let's honor that kind of stuff rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. But they can and, for NSF funding or for funding from other agencies to support their work that is specific to International Polar Year 5. Yeah, um, Adelheid in a comment mentioned that uh, APU um, is in discussions with uh, the Alaska Native Science Commission and Patricia Cochran, who is really um, critical to that effort. Um, and so we are looking for opportunities, funding opportunities that maybe, you know, we could host it at Alaska Pacific University. But I think right now we're just looking for the right, the right fit. But I agree also with Margaret is like a lot of us are already doing the work. And so maybe that's just more more networking between all of us or but yeah. Okay, Matthew. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Matthew Druckmiller. Um, thanks to the panel. Uh, I think you all shared so much, and I also acknowledge that you all have also shared just a lot in recent years through publishing in different outlets, and it's been a, a big service to organizations like the PRB. Um, I think a lot of our discussion, a lot of what you shared today really was was in an Alaskan context, but certainly is relevant to the international Arctic. And I know you all have international experience as well. So um, considering some of the limiting factors that were, were mentioned, funding being one, individual capacity, burnout being a few others, I'm curious what, what you see as maybe the, the limiting factor to international indigenous cooperation, collaboration, kind of in the spirit of what Ross mentioned, that IPY could really be an opportunity for the indigenous peoples to come together across the Arctic and recognizing that indigenous peoples are also transboundary across national boundaries. Um, so I'm curious if you have thoughts as to what that limiting factor might be for that international indigenous collaboration, or to maybe flip it, uh, what what is you know, kind of a singular opportunity to really drive that. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, I'm part of Permafrost Pathways, the adaptation lead. We do have a policy team as well that does international policy as well as local policy in the state of Alaska. Um, I think a limiting factor in my experience, because we do have a lot of international opportunity for tribal members that we've been working with for years to attend, um, is, uh, priorities. Um, I think a, a big limiting factor is comfort. Um, and that is very broad, but I think that is a limiting factor. Like in my experience, in my work, people in the communities want to do what's best for the communities, right? Like then and there, they want clean drinking water, uh, they want permafrost research uh, for a report that they have. They want more community focused things done um, because they are eroding at, you know, three times the rate as the rest of the world and they're heating at three times the rate as the rest of the world. And so they are adapting constantly um, and they're having to mitigate climate change constantly. And while a lot of what's happening should be frontline news and everyone should know about it, they're just trying to adapt. Right. And they're trying to do what's best for their community. Um in a way that they need and, and is urgent. Um, so in terms of priorities, um, I think going to COP, right, or going to other international gatherings might not be priority number one. And I think that comes down to capacity. Um, there's only so many people in a village, there's only so much money, right, available, and there's only so much time given the seasons that they live in. Um, and, you know, taking 
it's a long haul to travel internationally. Um, you know, you have jet lag and, you know, being gone for two weeks at a time out of the year is a big chunk of time. That's why I don't travel internationally anymore. Um, I can't be away from my family that long. Um, I can't, you know, be not on the land for that long. It's, it's a lot. And to fill a space that is very uncomfortable for me, where my voice has just been shut down year after year after year. Like it's, it's not worth it to me. Um, and I think that I can do better work locally, um, personally for me. And I've heard similar, um, thoughts from other people in the communities. So I think maybe priority, um, funding obviously is one, um, and you know, time, um, respecting, you know, the way that they live, uh, it's very different than here. Like in my village where I'm from, we don't have a grocery store, so we have to live off the land. Like the land is our grocery store. We haul water, we go hunting, we go fishing. Um, we used to go fishing. There's no more fish, but yeah, it's, I think it's a combination of that. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but that's just my personal experience. I think at the pan Arctic level, I think there's some really interesting things in the sense of research recommendations from different groups um, that I quite often point to and think about and kind of where I see my role is how we operationalize those recommendations. And I think, you know, having capacity at the tribes and having those community leaders are really crucial, but also to having staff um, who aren't necessarily these indigenous leaders, but also staff to like actually focus on operationalizing these things would be really useful as kind of a category of um, people because, yeah, there's just usually a lot of meetings to attend and yeah, a lot of liaisoning, a lot of work, a lot of also to like creating monitoring programs, a lot of those elements, um, I think, would be kind of, I think, something that hasn't been talked about. Okay, sorry, Jenny, we did not get to your question. And um, I think this means that we should continue these conversations moving into the future. This has been, a, a, I feel, a big step forward in ensuring that Indigenous leadership is involved in IPY5 and delivers for, for uh, Indigenous communities. I want to thank the panelists and everyone who has attended in person and on Zoom. Um, we will have a break until three o'clock um, and then we will pick back up um, hearing from federal agencies. Thank you. Okay, everybody, if we could uh, take our seats and turn our attention to the third and final panel today. Um, you know who I am, um, but in, with a slightly different hat on, I'm co-moderating this panel, which is the federal agency's role in international research coordination. Uh, this is not specifically about International Poly Year because we were asked by um, a particular agency not to make it about International Poly Year per se. Um, so it is about international research collaboration in the polar regions uh, more generally, but of course there would be potentially many lessons to be learned from what we're about to hear, or it could inform how we choose to move forward and, and so on. Um, the co-moderator of the panel is Adriana Muir, and I see Adriana there in a little posted stamp. Hi, Adriana. Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Martin. Hi, everyone. My name is Adriana Muir. Um, I'm coming to you from Denina Lands in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I work for the Nature Conservancy an international environmental organization where I work for our North America region as the director of conservation collaboration. 
Um, so in my day-to-day -day job, I struggle with coordination and how to do that across different states and countries. Um, I'm also a member of the Polar Research Board. Um, but before doing that for the Nature Conservancy and before living in Alaska um, in a former life, I worked with many of you. I see some familiar faces there on the panel and in the room. Nice to see you all. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. working for the Department of the Interior and Department of State on Arctic issues of environmental protection, um, science coordination, uh, a lot of that with the Arctic Council. Nice to be with you. Um, and I'm excited for another good panel, one without any slides, but just good discussion. Okay, thanks, Adriana. So um, I have a formal sentence here on paper that I'm going to uh, read off about the session topic. Um, the session will explore how federal agencies with interests in the polar regions approach international research coordination. What has worked, what has been a challenge, and where there are opportunities to improve. So that's the the big picture for you. And then there are more specific questions, as you know, that you will hear in due course. Um, but for the moment, um, if I could ask each panelist to say a little bit about themselves, your name, who you work for, and particular work you do that relates to this topic. One or two sentences, it says. It doesn't say anything about the length of the sentence. Beginning with Kelly, you go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting uh, me. I'm Kelly Chris. I'm the, this is going to be a little confusing, um, but I'll, we'll walk through it. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Fisheries at NOAA, uh, but that is not why I'm here. Uh, uh, early in my tenure in that job, Dr. Spinrad asked me to also lead NOAA's Arctic policy portfolio. Uh, and so I have, I wear a second hat within NOAA um, in the leadership team to kind of coordinate our Arctic policy and, uh, um, and work, particularly through the state of Alaska. So that's more than two sentences, but I feel like the one thing leads to many questions and best to answer that right off the bat. So thanks again for including me here. Thanks, Kelly. And Dr. Spinrad is Rick Spinrad, chief scientist of NOAA, right? He's now the NOAA administrator. Oh, I'm way but behind. For, <laughs> but former chief scientist and and former he he led two of the line offices as well. Yes. Okay. And NOS, yeah. All right. Thanks. So we all know who Dr. Spinrad is now, particularly me. Uh, Torsten, please go ahead. Hi everyone. I'm I'm Torsten Marcus. I'm at NASA headquarters. I manage um, among other things, I manage the Cryosphere program at headquarters. I manage um, couple of satellite missions. I'm going to manage uh, Earth system explorers. I'm also relevant for this panel. Maybe I'm um, the point of contact for IARPIC, Interagency Arctic Research and Policy Committee. Um, yeah, and a couple of other things. NSIDC is under my, um, uh, um, yeah, I manage NSIDC as well as a NASA portion of it, I should say. And it's maybe enough. Thank you. Thank you. So also thanks for inviting me. The, uh, so I'm a Department of Energy and uh, I'm a division director within DOE for, it's called Earth and Environmental System Sciences. And basically we focus on a, a fairly large modeling portfolio for the, for the, for the planet where the, where the Arctic is of course a, an important component. We also have some long-term field activities uh, up in Alaska. One is called the NG Arctic. It's a, really a permafrost ecology project. It's several sites across Alaska. And we have the uh, ARM user facility on the North Slope. But I would say beyond that, we have a significant investment in modeling across scales that cover the Arctic Ocean, Pan-Arctic, shipping up there, uh, you name it. Uh, and I think I'll just stop. Thanks. And uh, thank you, Martin. Good to see you again, Adriana. Good to see you again, uh, too. I'm Ben D'Angelo. I'm also with NOAA. I'm in the research arm, and there I'm serving as the acting director of the Climate Program Office. Um, within the Climate Program Office, we do not have a dedicated um, Arctic or polar research program, but um, 
uh, depending on um, our um, grant solicitations and one, one of our bread and butter functions in our office is to um, run competitive grant programs. Um, sometimes they're sometimes they're focused on the on the Arctic. Um, sometimes they're not. Um, but a key reason why I'm here is because um, uh, over a number of years, I've been playing uh, different roles within the Arctic Council. And uh, most recently, um, uh, uh, my time has been focused on one of the working groups under the Arctic Council, and that's AMAP, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. And I, I chaired um, uh, that, uh, that working group uh, recently up until uh, the fall of last year. Thanks, Gwen. And last but not least, we have a fifth panelist who is not with us physically in the room today, but Nancy Sun of NSF is at 69 degrees north in Cambridge Bay. Uh, I think that's not Northwest Territory, the other one. It's, uh, the other one. No, no, no. Uh, None of us, thank you. And Nancy is up there with you. Yes. Sorry? She's up there with the Arctic Research Commission visiting the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. Nancy, I know your time is somewhat limited. You have other obligations, obviously. But if you could introduce yourself, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks for joining me. Sure, thank you. And I think my internet may not be entirely stable, but I'm really delighted to join you. And apologies first to not be there in person and also that the, the schedules conflict so I can just be with you until 3.30 um, your time. So I'm at the National Science Foundation in our Office of Polar Programs, and I cover uh, policy and international engagement at both poles, Arctic and Antarctic. And so have worked uh, with our team to um, forge new relationships to steward the ones we have. Um, and as anyone who's working at the polls knows, it's it's international by definition. So um, really excited to be part of this today. Thank you, Martin. Thanks very much, Nancy. So I'm going to hand over to Adriana now, um, to um, ask the question. Thanks, Martin. Your microphone was off, but I think you were... Um, passing it over to me so we can start on some of our questions. Is that right? Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, I keep okay. um, And as Nancy mentioned, she's only with us until the bottom of the hour. And so I really want to take advantage of having her coming to us live from the Arctic. Um, so um, I've got a question for all of the panelists, but Nancy, if you wouldn't mind first chiming in um, and if you'd like to expand upon the answer to this question with anything else that's on your mind for international cooperation and research, please share it with us before you go. Um, the first questions I think are kind of softball questions <laughs> um, is how does your agency approach international research coordination, generally speaking? And what are some examples that you have of how you do that successfully? Um, what are sort of the bright spots that come to mind for you when you think about how your agency does that coordination well? So we'll go to Nancy first, if you please. Um, and then any of the panelists. Sure, I'm to jump in first. In person, yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Great. Great, thank you. And a good opening softball question, right? Um, yeah, so NSF, we have two merit re review criteria, right, for everything that we do. One of them is intellectual merit and the other is broader impacts. And I won't go into a deep definition of what those are, but really wherever we will collaborate internationally in any project that would strengthen both of those, uh, the intellectual merit of a project and its broader impacts. And then beyond that, in partners and in international partners, we're looking for mutual benefit, um, compatibility and transparency of the review process, um, reciprocity and sharing data. Um, really, those are what, when we're looking for partners, that's what we're looking for in those. And, and then, of, of course, icing on the cake of all of that would be science diplomacy, you know, when it really is, when those are aligned really well with um, U.S. foreign policy uh, interests, then that makes it a, a perfect sort of thing to move into. But as a as a uh, science agency, we're looking for primarily strengthening that and happy to elaborate more, but I'll turn it over to the others. Thanks, 
for those of you in the room, please just go ahead and um, sort of put on your microphones in whatever order you like. Yeah, hi, this is Torsten. Um, yeah, so international coordination is something that's very important to us. And we do, do it on, on several ways and in several um, aspects. We do it, you know, top down as well as bottoms up. We have our satellite missions that are very often international coordinated missions. We have missions together with ESA, with DAXA. We are, we're planning a, a satellite mission, NISA, together with the Indian Space Agency. So we have that level of international coordination, which is, starts with you know big MOUs where uh, other agencies contribute um, instruments, et cetera. We are also uh, very actively involved in uh, international organizations like WMO, WCRP, uh, CGMS, all those international co coordination offices we are participating in and then provide our contribution wherever we, wherever we can. And, and those things very often become a line item in our budget. So that's um, where we do like the, the top down uh, um, effort to promote international coordination. We also do the bottoms up where, you know, sign on the scientist level or maybe on the program manager level, we establish coordination with other uh, other countries. Um, we have very successfully collaborated uh, in the past. We still do with uh, the Australian Antarctic Division. We have several people going on icebreakers, go to Antarctica um, via the Australian Antarctic Division. We we are now talking with um, the Argentinian research organizations to coordinate uh, flights over Antarctica using their air aircraft, providing our instruments. So, and then we have scientists and similar to what NSF is doing, where, you know, scientists establish a coordination with, uh, with uh, international partners and they pro put uh, this in, 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 in their proposals that we uh, evaluate. So it's, we do international coordination on, on very different levels. And it's, as I said, it's a very important part of what we're doing. Could I, could I? Yeah. Does anyone know what CGMS is? Sorry. Uh, uh, Coordination Group for Meteorological Satellites. Thank you, sorry. Let's let's try and speak in the English language, not acronyms and yeah, abbreviations no, if we can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, so we are participating in those coordination discussions. Yeah, similar to WCRP, World Research Climate Pro Program and yeah, WMO. Okay, I'm going to keep a check on the acronyms. I think NOAA uh, excels at them. Uh, and I'm, I'm new to NOAA though, just two and a half years. So maybe it's not uh, fully uh, ingrained yet in my uh, lexicon. Um, Adriana, I think this question is a little challenging actually. Um, as I was thinking about it, uh, I think that there's a multi-level kind of approach uh, that NOAA takes. Um, and I think in the international space, we can break this down in, in a few different ways. Um, uh, you'll hear from Ben about a multilateral um, uh, kind of organization. We just heard from Thorsten about the WMO, which NOAA also participates in. Um, I think we've got these formal multilateral and bilateral opportunities to foster um, international uh, coordination um, in the Arctic. Uh, through the Arctic Council, um, I'm going to flag one that I participate directly in, which is the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. Um, it's a little bit more off the radar, but emerging uh, as a pretty important forum for the 10 parties who participate in that. And I can get into the details of that later. I think here there's, um, and, and I'm going to be a little bit of provocative, I think, in, um, in saying that the some of the focus for NOAA um, and, and the, the, during the time that I've been working on the Arctic portfolio, I would note that we have a lot of work to do domestically uh, to understand what's happening in, in, our, in, our, in Alaska and, and in the parts of Alaska that make us an Arctic state, um, enabling us to participate in these multilateral fora. And the things that we learn um, domestically uh, can contribute to that international dialogue um, and create a better understanding of the Arctic uh, environment and ecosystem. Um, so I think that, that 
keeping a little bit of a focus on, on what we can do and, and how the things that we understand in, in um, our own Arctic can, um, uh, we can leverage and contribute to. And certainly that has a real role right now, given the geopolitical uh, scenario we find ourselves in where um, many Arctic states can't talk to one Arctic state. Um, and so uh, how do we, how do we use the resources that we have um, to fill some of the gaps? And I'll also just flag that by, by focusing domestically, we also have an opportunity um, through that work to bring in indigenous knowledge holders and keep that priority also um, uh, really uh, elevated, uh, given that uh, sometimes the international cooperation pieces of that and the multilateral uh, negotiations don't always um, have a hard baked way of, of including indigenous knowledge holders in those negotiations. Um, we're also guided at the moment by the national strategy for the Arctic region, which pillar four focuses, I think it's pillar four focuses on international collaboration and cooperation. So I think that uh, for the approach, we're also, we have kind of high level guidance, also the IARPIC, not only the five-year plan, but the biennial implementation plan. And finally, um, the, I would note the, uh, the US Arctic Research Commission goals um, uh, report also provides kind of some high level guidance on, on the US agency approach to this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop in the interest of, of giving um, uh, the other panelists an opportunity, but if we have a chance maybe to talk about also informal uh, cooperation, collaboration and the role of potentially science diplomacy here, uh, I think there's some opportunities in our international approach there. Uh, so thanks. I guess I'm next. So at Department of Energy, actually, I'm I'm at I'm at the Office of the Science within DOE, which is kind of a unique place because it it emphasizes basic research. We find a little bit of applied research, but it's mostly basic. And the recognition is that any issue involving the Arctic is multinational, it's just not just the US. So we're one of the few agencies that actually funds uh, international institutions and international PIs within our portfolios. It's a small fraction, it might be just 10%. Uh, in fact, ONR used to do it as well when I was working there. But uh, we do recognize that having an international perspective is important for the kinds of things we do. So for permafrost ecology, which is part of our NG project, they're coordinating quite closely with other uh, research groups that are doing similar types of work. Uh, it's in Scandinavia and Greenland, other places. I guess you can guess where the other places are. But the, uh, but the point is you can't do anything in isolation by just focusing here on the US. And I think that's our position. As far as... Um, our individual projects, I would say the ARM user facility, which we have one on the North Slope. There are five other ones which are deployed around the planet. One of those was deployed as part of Mosaic. Another one was up, at, up in Norway at the same time, up on Abionaya. And the, uh, I would say the other sites which are, in the, uh, which are relevant to this community is we've had one in Antarctica, We've had, you know, in several other places, but the point is we try to establish uh, collaborations with local institutions, whether they be in Scandinavia, in Alaska, or anywhere else in the Arctic to make sure that we have some collaborations that will be sustained. Um, I would say beyond that, we have a fairly large modeling activity through, here's an acronym for you, called CMIP. It's called the Climate Model Intercomparison Project. The Arctic is a big component of that, especially because it's changing so rapidly. So it, it deserves a lot of attention and we're giving it significant attention through our investments, through these model intercomparison uh, efforts. Um, I would say beyond that, we have periodic reviews, especially of our national lab projects and a typical lab, lab project is for three years, but they're sustained. They're just kind of, continuing on because these are long-term investments in our lab, labs. And it's extremely typical 
that is international representation on these review panels. In fact, we couldn't live without that because the kinds of issues which we're taking on are international. I think at this point, I'll just stop and pass it to Ben. Thanks, Gary. Um, so uh, because I wanted to uh, use the, the Arctic Council and its working groups as a kind of go-to example throughout the discussion, I thought um, I would just very, very briefly, um, this may or may not be uh, news to folks, just about the, the status, status update on the Arctic Council um, itself. So I think a lot of you know we're already um, half, halfway through the two-year Norwegian chairmanship of the Arctic Council. It was Russia before that. Um, obviously, a complete pause was put in place um, um, for over a year or so. And then just, just recently this year, the eight Arctic states and the six um, groups representing the Arctic indigenous peoples uh, referred to as permanent participants in, in the Ar Arctic Council agreed that, um, that finally at the working group level that meetings were finally able to uh, take place again, but virtually, uh, but only virtually. Um, and um, this has been a good help because it's finally, um, you finally have uh, a platform to talk about any new ideas you finally have some incentive to bring a new idea to the table because up to this point, um, really no idea could be uh, acted upon. Um, so the Arctic Council is by no means back to business as usual. We are, we are far from that, um, but, there is, um, but there is life again in the Arctic Council. Activities are happening at the working group level. Above the working group level, um, at the senior Arctic official level and higher, there are still no, no meetings taking place. Um, but again, the technical work is happening. Um, it, it's long been um, just a kind of a, a personal goal of mine to get more people across my agency, NOAA, and across US government agencies involved in um, AMAP and Arctic Council activities. Um, I, I think, um, uh, these and kind of all international activities offer really good rewarding opportunities for early career um, scientists. And I think by and large, um, from where I sit, I think we, we do need some new blood in, in, um, uh, in the Arctic Council working group activities. Um, because the Arctic Council is, it's a fairly small operation compared to the scale of say, you know, I, IPCC. Um, because of that, a lot of what we do to coordinate across NOAA and across other agencies is more, uh, is more informal, um, informal in nature compared to the more kind of formal calls for inputs and authors that, um, that we typically do for, um, for IPCC. And that can, and, and, and reliance on informal mechanisms can be both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, you can be more nimble um, but sometimes it's always um, challenging to know whether or not you're, you're getting the word out broadly enough or that there, there's always um, a challenge of knowing whether or not you have, have the right people involved or whether or not you've put in enough effort, effort uh, to socialize um, activities under the Arctic Council to get the right, uh, to get the right people involved. Um, uh, that's not to say we never uh, make use of formal mechanisms for purposes of the Arctic Council. There are times when we, for example, um, go to uh, IARPIC uh, to give um, status updates and presentations and use that form for input. And then uh, we have also made use of the uh, State Department-led um, Arctic Policy Group, which includes many, many agencies with um, equities in the Arctic to um, uh, for you know, reviews of uh, formal things, such as summary for policymakers of high, what what might be high, more high profile um, Arctic Council reports. Um, I'll end there for now. Uh, I think we still have a few more minutes where Nancy is still able to join us. So Nancy, um, I'm hoping that you can 
So reflect um, either on more of how your agency goes about cooperation or what your bright spots may be, or um, we're soon gonna turn our attention to what the challenges are and what you think the opportunities are for um, PRB or for other organizations to help spur cooperation. So we'd welcome any of your closing thoughts before you leave. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe one comment to make having heard what everyone else said is that the majority of our international collaborations that, that NSF supports are PI to PI. So they're pretty bottom up grassroots level. You know, scientists meet each other at meetings and they have an idea, let's do this together. And they work out themselves the mutual benefit and generally, NSF will support the, the U.S. side and rely on their collaborators to find support from their science agencies in whatever country they're from. So that's the vast majority. But in a way, that's often like I think of it as like whacking your way through the jungle, you know, with a machete uh, in that you have to figure everything out as you go and make your own path. And but sometimes there are areas where we think there's a there's a, maybe a higher priority between us and another country where maybe we want to make a bridge or a paved road, make it easier for them to work together. And that's where it rises to the level of agency to agency, where NSF might create, um, build that bridge by working with another science agency in another country. Um, and that takes a lot of time. Um, and it's, it's difficult enough for a bilateral um, relationship. And then if we want it to be multilateral, that's even harder. And really what it comes down to is relationship really understanding uh, the partner that, we're, that we wanna work with, what are their issues, what are their concerns, uh, what's valuable to them and building trust and, and really a lot of listening. And I think maybe we have um, a difficult, we're in a difficult situation right now because we're, we're still kind of emerging from COVID in terms of rebuilding what's been lost. And so a lot of those relationships that really couldn't happen for a couple of years, um, NSF, anyway, we're we're trying very hard now to rebuild those relationships, to reestablish those ties so that we then have a, a platform to work on to build more long-term collaboration. So maybe that's, you know, one reflection I'll put out there is just the importance of relationships and how are we doing at that? And uh, between agencies to agencies and then scientist to scientist, are we facilitating that? Um, maybe another thing that's unique to the polls, somewhat unique, is that we have not only science that needs to be considered and evaluated before we can fund it, but we have to put the logistics in place. It's really different from working in other parts of the world. And I think that the coordination between the availability of logistics um, and the quality of the science and the timing of the science, um, this is very challenging for us to do, even within one agency let alone the way we handle logistics and science versus the way another country does and who is our counterpart as we work all of that through. So I think those are some of the challenges that NSF is, is trying to tackle as we kind of get back into this and try to build really robust um, collaborations into the future. And as we look ahead to IPY, it's a great uh, opportunity that kind of pulls us forward in that direction. So I'm, I'm really hoping we can um, do a lot more of that and, um, I guess, solve these issues by having many, many conversations. Um, so maybe I, I would leave that with just this puzzle of how do we solve logistics and science together uh, as one country and then as we uh, collaborate with others, that's one big challenge. Another is just that the, um, the situation in the Arctic and the Antarctic is very different. Eight nations have sovereign territory in the Arctic that's not the case in the Antarctic. We're under the treaty. So the, the way we work together is very different. And just the dynamics of, of how we do that is different. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's exciting to be able to move into that. Um, but those are some of the, the uh, key things I see that we will have to think hard about um, as we move forward. And, and I regret I do have to sign off, but I hope uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing this discussion um, later. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We're glad you were able to join us. And I believe that one of your, your colleagues from um, NSF might be in the room in person with people. So hopefully there's an opportunity to connect more if you have interest in NSF, people can do that during the breaks. Good luck with the rest of your time and your visit <laughs> and your research. Um, well, now back to those of you in the room. Um, I think we heard a lot about, you know, just generally how your, your agencies or how the Arctic Council goes about um, international cooperation. 
Um, before we turn to more of the challenges and some of the other really interesting um, issues that you brought up, I wonder if there are any other bright spots, any other positive reflections that we can share before we jump into the challenges and sort of how we move forward. Yeah, like a, a good example, I think, for international coordination is what I wanted to bring up is coordination that we're having with ESA. We have a working group, a joint program working group. And for example, the ice sheet mass balance uh, intercomparison exercise is a jointly funded ESA NASA effort where you know we co we coordinate on the on the programmatic level, and then the scientists coordinate on on the scientific level. And I think. Um, the results of the, the big impact papers that came out of IMBI, you know, show the, the, the success of like international coordination that worked really well. So we have this program that, um, you know, where we discuss with ESA to, to establish joint programs and then we, you know, dedicate some funding to these, uh, specifically to these international uh, efforts. Um, the other thing what working really well is um, as you may know, we have lots of airborne campaigns, not only in the Arctic or in the Antarctic, but also recently in Africa and, and Asia. And, and how we do this, we work through the embassies most of the time. So they are the, the, the entity that helps us establishing the international uh, coordination that we can use, the, the airspace, the air, airports, etc. So that's also working really well. And there are some opportunities here for us to establish better coordination with other countries, you know, for, for the polar regions, it comes up, we should col collaborate, coordinate better more with uh, South America, especially for, with regard to Antarctica. You know, um, but overall, um, I think in terms of airborne, we made really good progress on coordinating with other countries. Yeah. Should we keep running down the line? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, I, did, I specifically didn't uh, mention any examples in the approach question, holding them for this discussion. Uh, and I think there's probably more than I can mention here. Uh, um, uh, and I want to mention at the outset, uh, I, again, I think that there's a couple layers to this. Um, what we do in the Arctic, um, we rely not just on international partners, but we have to rely on the interagency. Um, so every every agency here at this table and the agencies not represented contribute to the US um, Arctic kind of mission. Uh, and I, don't, I probably don't have to say this in this room, but the uh, this work is chronically underfunded, um, sparse, sparsely represented. We're in Noah's case, um, the work that we do to provide decision-making support, um, not just for residents of Alaska, um, really for the international community, um, plus the lower 48, uh, we don't have nearly the same um, uh, granular resolution um, on things that contribute to our ability to provide weather forecasts, things that we take for granted in many places in the lower 48. Um, uh, and so, but across the NOAA enterprise, which is super impressive, um, you know, uh, to Thorsten's point, um, NOAA also has satellites uh, up in uh, up in space, um, doing all of the uh, that observation, the data, the modeling. Um, we have six line offices. Each each one of those six, and I didn't know what line office means, um, but they're kind of uh, I guess vertical uh, vertical work. Yeah, organizations sorry. within within NOAA. We have six of them. All six of them have part of the NOAA Arctic mission. So it's really a one NOAA effort um, that happens. The work then happens through each of the lines. But on the coordination of the international research efforts, again, dependent on our ability to coordinate with the interagency who brings assets to the questions we're asking that NOAA alone can't do. Um, I think there's so there's a lot, um, and there's more to do, obviously. But um, uh, Gary mentioned mosaic, uh, and uh, that was uh, Noah had a, a a role in that. And as an oceanographer myself and an Antarctic research um, researcher, I just think what what a beautiful idea this was to emplace a ship and uh, and kind of get beyond both the um, 
the discrete measurements that we have when using a research ship and turn it into a kind of permanent observing platform. Um, and I'm really excited to see the results that come out of that, but uh, truly international um, and hopefully really, uh, uh, you know, from everything I've seen so far, successful. Um, and again, maybe to the NSF model, uh, a little bit more ground up than the, than the formal multilateral um, uh, uh, other options that we've discussed through IPCC, through Arctic Council, through um, uh, the WMO. And I wanna mention one other one. This one has an acronym that I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce because I'm probably gonna get it wrong, but it is the Executive Council Panel on Polar and High Mountain Observations Research and Services. I'm gonna go with EC4s. Does that sound familiar? Um, uh, and these types of things help facilitate NOAA's um, ability to participate and contribute to our understanding of vulnerable regions um, where we're experiencing changes in snow and permafrost and glaciers um, and, uh, and do that by leveraging uh, other members of the uh, WMO. Uh, there's... NOAA for the most part makes all of our data publicly available and usable. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's uh, also contributes to um, international partners who might not have the same level of capacity um, that the United States is bringing with respect to the research enterprise. Uh, so I think that that's a really important contribution that we make to international collaboration. Even if some of that work is being done with a domestic focus, that's, those are, that's a contribution we're making. And I think that that's a successful model as we look at uh, transparency, um, uh, data equality, um, and, uh, uh, and how, do we, uh, how do we support um, the interests of others? Uh, so I think those are a couple of examples. I'm gonna save one for what I think it could be a challenge, but could be an opportunity um, and doesn't yet have a success story attached to it. Um, but again, I'll just reiterate that what we do, particularly in this region, depends on both the interagency and by the interagency for the points that Nancy was making, that means the uh, researchers that are supported through grants um, and are part of the kind of the uh, larger picture. So those of you at, at academic institutions and elsewhere who are also contributing to the, um, are deepening our understanding of the Arctic through uh, international collaborations. It was a long answer, but there's so much really to unpack in this space. And so thank you for the question. So it's my turn, I guess. I have an advantage. I can listen to two presentations and kind of try to craft a message. So I, we've heard Mosaic is a good example. And I'm going to build on that too. But I just wanted to mention, and I'm not going to bogged down with time, five key points here. They're all related. And one is that if the if international activities is a priority for the agencies, it really depends on relationship building between a US set of investigators and investigators in, in different countries. And that takes a long time. In the case of Mosaic, or in the case of some of our ARM deployments, in fact, our ARM facility has been in China, it's been in a lot of countries which you would, wouldn't have expected, but it was based upon a lot of socializing several years in advance. We provided funding on both sides several years in advance. Even on Mosaic, I think we committed funds to that project two or three years before it started just to get the ball rolling. But the point is there are also cultural differences that we need to take into account. And the metrics for personal success might be different here compared to a collaborating uh, institution in a different country. And somehow those need to be taken into account as these relationships evolve. Another thing I wanted to mention is funding mechanisms. We typically fund grants for these um, international activities, but very often these grants lack enough travel resources so we can bring people here or we can send people over there. And we've made an effort over the past years to make sure that there's sufficient funding for that. So at least we can get people together before the projects start, uh, during, and for some years afterwards. 
And I, and my, with my last phrase, some years afterwards, that's a key thing too, because relationship buildings need to be sustained because it takes a long time to build up these relationships and you can't just let them drop. You have to keep them going because it's almost, almost a form of science diplomacy once one gets into these types of um, collaborations. One last point is data. And this came up during Mosaic. In fact, we were in a constant uh, tussle with uh, the Germans. We were in tussles with other countries because we had an armed facility deployed on the Polish Dam. And it wasn't just the radars, but it was also sites on the, on the ice, on the sea ice. It was a massive activity. So when it came to uh, deciding how the data would be managed across all of Mosaic, we hadn't spent enough time in advance to work that out. And that would be my recommendation is that whenever a large international activity does take place, it could be a small activity, but if it's international, there are different data protocols in each country. And it's important to get those worked out in advance. And of course we got them worked out, but if it was an advance, it would have been so much easier. I think I'll stop there um, and pass it down. We're still talking, we're talking bright spots. Um, I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention two, uh, two examples um, that are um, uh, maybe kind of fairly specific projects, but I, but I think um, uh, they offer um, some um, uh, more broadly applicable models. Uh, one is uh, an activity that um, uh, took place in, in the Arctic Council focused on um, short-lived climate forcers, uh, focused on, on black carbon and methane emissions and their unique role um, in, um, in the Arctic. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the key elements of this work that I think made it, made it successful was that uh, the national representatives and the Arctic indigenous groups first identified key questions, uh, uh, policy relevant needs, policy relevant questions as the starting point, rather than, rather than starting with just um, research needs of, of, of the scientists. So those, um, that kind of policy relevant uh, framing um, set, set the stage for this assessment so that the assessment was kind of on a, on a mission to, to address fairly, um, uh, uh, fairly you know, concrete needs and questions. And then there was also a good balance of, of academic and government scientists involved, uh, a good balance of um, uh, centers of excellence in different countries. And um, uh, one, one result is that um, there is now kind of a, a, a community um, that's still uh, together, kind of a center of excellence um, you know, multidisciplinary um, atmospheric scientists, health scientists, um, and I and I think this work in in the Arctic in the Arctic Council has established itself as um, essentially a, a center of excellence for for these kinds of topics. Um, they were taking on something that was um, uh, done in a way that I, I I don't think could have been done as as well in in any other forum, and really complemented some of the work. That you see, say, in IPCC um, and um, UNF um, climate change um, uh, convention process. Um, other uh, quick example I'll mention is um, our uh, our national uh, climate assessment. Um, uh, not so long ago, we wrapped up the fifth national climate assessment. Um, there is a dedicated Alaska chapter in that assessment, and I think the process of that assessment brought together a good diverse community of um, academic researchers and practitioners, um, government, non-government um, scientists um, uh, with, you know, with input from, from the region about uh, the key, uh, key needs to address. And, um, and now the, the sixth national climate assessment under the uh, US Global Change Research Program is, is ramping up and there's already um, uh, uh, opportunities are already out there for people to get um, involved. So. Thank you all for reflecting on the bright spots. Um, I heard a lot of commonalities there, supportive structures, funding in place, 
Um, work is, of course, a mutual benefit or, or benefit to even more than two parties. Um, strong internal coordination and foundation, especially for the interagency, um, and relationships and sustained relationships. And it sounds like, you know, coming out of that, um, I think it was Kelly who mentioned, you know, there's definitely data that's produced. It's successful. Somehow there are results, right, that you get out of really good work. Um, it could be creative. It definitely needs to have a complicated acronym. Um, there's an ongoing willingness to collaborate. Um, and hopefully, you know, whatever is generated is also felt to be really relevant um, internationally. And it's really moving ahead more than one need felt by, by more than one party. Um, that's what I was hearing from your bright spots. But I don't think it's that hard to turn some of these same opportunities and reflect on the challenges. Um, some of you already alluded to this. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll try not to editorialize. I've got some of my own leading questions that I could get into, but I'd rather just open the floor and just hear from you. Um, what are the challenges to this? This isn't necessarily easy. Many of us um, tend to want to revert to stay in our own silos when collaboration and coordination gets hard. And so what is it about this that makes it challenging, especially when you think about this internationally and in the Arctic as well as the Antarctic? Yeah, so well, I guess I start again, um, which is fine. So the challenge is a little bit. So I think you know the scientists are always you know willing, eager to to engage in international efforts. The challenge for us is, as a funding agency is a little bit where should we put our funds? You know, what should we fund? And you know, as you may know, uh, NASA together with uh, NSF, we brought the Click International Program Office to the United States. Uh, and we had a review just the other month by WMO. So CLIC is under climate and, climate and cryosphere. CLIC is under WMO. Just the other month, we had a review with um, international funding agencies to see how can we increase our impact. And how, how can we increase CLIC's impact? And the challenge for this, and, and, and one topic that came up in this discussion was you know, there are so many international coordination groups that it's hard for us. To whom should we listen to? There's I ask, there's SCAR, there's, you know, CLIC, obviously, I mentioned CLIC. And it's all great, but I, if I want to get funds dedicated to an effort, because these international coordination coordinating groups are very important because they provide us, you know, with information. What are the most urgent questions? What should be addressed? And then the question is for us, where should we invest? Should we be, I talked with Dana earlier, should we invest in rings, like one of these SCAR actions? Which SCAR action should we support? We cannot support everything. What is worthwhile supporting? And it is tricky. And, and especially for the Arctic, it feels like there are so many coordinating groups that, you know, I'm, there are so many coordinating meetings. I don't even know how many Arctic meetings there are on, on different topics. And I, I feel sometimes I can't go any, to any of them because there's just way too many. And I think that's a real challenge, you know, because we, where's the one voice? And I'm struggling with this sometimes. I appreciate all the work that goes into CLIC, goes into IAS, goes, goes into SCAR. And I appreciate the um, engagement by the committees, by the scientists who are super engaged. But it's hard to... For us, as a, as a funding agency, we cannot fund everything. You know, where should, you know, what should I take to my management and say, hey, we should be part of this, we should put money into this effort, this is worthwhile doing. So that's, a, for me, that's a challenge. Any of this that came to my mind. I, I want to take advantage of the going object here. Oh, <laughs> I see your point. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things on challenges. Um, first one I'll just mention is data, data management. We haven't, we didn't have a problem in the Arctic that wasn't resolved, but we did have problems with uh, some countries where uh, the, the data on their side surprisingly became classified and we lost access to it unless we paid for it. So there were things like that that came up. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about China in this particular case. 
but it's not the kind of thing you would have expected, but we have to at least be aware that anything is possible and some provisions need to go into the negotiations on data management well beforehand. So that's just a, a challenging episode that we faced once. Another one is um, the whole idea of uh, science diplomacy. And I would say this is a challenge where we could use some help from uh, the Polar Research Board. Because science diplomacy is something which is taken up either by the State Department or the White House. And if there are regions where one wants to develop international collaborations, like the Arctic, uh, it would be no surprise if some of the issues are politicized. And that certainly is the case right now in the Arctic. So if there was a, a central organization such as the uh, PRB or some other organization similar to you, it could be IARPIC, but it's how do we develop the uh, right path forward to assure that some major international collaboration which goes across the Arctic can proceed uh, you know, in, a, in a sensible scientific way where we can work out the kinks through science diplomacy well in advance. And I think that's a, a challenge which I think we're going to increasingly face. I'll stop there. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple. One is one is just the um, priority. Um, I mean, we we've uh, kind of um, you know within within NOAA, I would say the the interest the interest in the Arctic uh, among among the scientists among the staff is is very very high. There's always a lot of willingness among uh, scientists to to um, Engage in the Arctic, um, uh, take part in in forums, um, but a lot of a lot of times the, um, the Ar Arctic uh, we kind of joke like always always just misses um, that that top tier of priority. If we have to identify top three priorities, um, Arctic ends up being number four, or if we identify four, it ends up being number five. So it oftentimes it feels like Arctic just always misses that that top top. Um, tier of um, high level priorities. Um, and um, uh, funding, stagnant uh, funding levels are, are a, an issue. Um, uh, I think uh, NOAA's Arctic Research Program, I'm looking over at Sandy Lucas in the room, has been at uh, relatively stable levels for many, many, um, uh, many, many years. Um, and um, just um, kind of, um, your 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 job description. There's a there's a lot of um, most most folks are not um, uh, kind of uh, dedicated international uh, people, and a lot of times to get people involved in international forums, you have to kind of ask them uh, to do things on on top of an already busy uh, day job. So having that just just getting people's time uh, that that carve out to uh, take part. Um, in an international forum that maybe had not been identified um, early on is, um, is just a real challenge because so often like the Arctic Council, many other forums, they're basically, you know, volunteer base and, and getting, getting people's time uh, to engage that, uh, that by itself is a big challenge. Okay, that choice paid dividends. Um, there's so there's so much there. Um, I had made a couple notes thinking about uh, this, but I think Ben laid out uh, some of the issues, and I and I venture to guess that this isn't unique to NOAA, uh, and from the agency perspective. But I'll start with the top level from a kind of a policy perspective, which is that all of the agencies are subject to what we I think lovingly referred to as unfunded mandates. Uh, things like the national strategy for the Arctic region sets the policy for us. It, it, it establishes where we need to prioritize, uh, but it doesn't come with the resources needed to support achieving some of those objectives. Um, and I think that it's a challenge because we look across what we're already doing and try to, try to incrementally kind of meet that. So the aspirational, what we could be doing, um, struggles in that unfunded mandate component. Um, and to that end, uh, we have been trying for the past three years to get the Arctic as that 
one, two, or three. Um, and, uh, and we have gotten traction uh, and the disconnect comes um, at, at different points in the budget decision-making process. Um, uh, but there's a great deal of willingness at NOAA leadership uh, in, in, this, in the current administration to support the Arctic. And I think that there, it resonates when we talk uh, amongst the NOAA team um, I think there's not understanding that that the there's just this lack of understanding that this applies for Arctic research writ large. This is an infrastructure. Nancy made this point. The infrastructure is not there. So if your instrument goes down, uh, it could be weeks, months, years before it, or ever if it comes back up. You might have to take a helicopter. You might need to leave a human there until a helicopter can come back. Um, this is not how we do things to get, like make a weather forecast in Nebraska. Um, your instrument goes down, you drive out, you fix it and you're back up. Um, uh, so when we try to explain delivering just the same amount of services that we're delivering here in Washington DC costs three to five times as much in the state of Alaska. That's true for all the research we do. So this is not an insignificant challenge is to even communicate, even to do the same thing it costs three to five times more. What if we wanted to do something entirely new? Um, how do you make that justification? Um, uh, I think I think the ambitions there um, for all of us who work on, Ar on Arctic science uh, and, and how do we sell that to decision makers to make the commitment in the investments needed? Um, so on that too, I mentioned it, but I just wanna say sustained observations is an ongoing challenge. Um, because of the harshness of the environment. And I do think that there's, ser there's so much opportunity for uh, technology development and testing. Uh, if you can get something to work in the Arctic, it's probably gonna work in Nebraska. So maybe we should flip the, flip the uh, dialogue or the flip the script here on, on how we're approaching like some of those basic, basic things um, uh, uh, so that we can maintain sustained observations in a place that is already challenging enough to, to work in without having enough information to make real-time decisions. On the unfunded mandate part, I'm gonna mention again, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. This is a multilateral agreement in which 10 parties agreed to participate. Um, it's ambitious. Uh, it is not a treaty-based organization. Uh, so it did not require any sort of Senate um, agreement just the agreement of the parties. It's really unique in the international coordination space because it applies a precautionary approach to um, industrial scale commercial fishing before it starts. So there's a moratorium on all commercial scale fishing in the Arctic for at least 16 years. We're three years into that, so it's now 13 years. And it's underpinned by a very ambitious joint program of scientific research and monitoring. Um, the entire agreement is underpinned by uh, the notion that we're going to conduct science to understand this environment so that we can make good decisions about managing any commercial scale fisheries that may emerge as a result of the changing environment there. Not a single one of those 10 countries is funded to do that. Okay, so we're all doing it as a coalition of the willing. Uh, this is where the coordination piece happens. Hey, Canada, do you have a research cruise going? Do you think we might be able to, you know, uh, uh, do, a, do a, a, you know, a bongo net? I don't know. Um, like, how are we going to understand this if none of us have the funding to do it? And so here I'm going to refer back to what I said is, is sometimes we have to look domestically. Um, what the Central Arctic Ocean looks like today uh, is not what it's going to look like in 10 years. But does the Bering Sea or the Chukchi Sea, something that's a little bit more accessible right now, have, is that, an, does that provide us the ability to access information and data and knowledge that will translate to a deeper understanding? Can, can we see the future in the environments that we do have access to now? So I think that thinking about how we do this um, has a couple of different components, but I did wanna flag it. The other really unique part about that agreement is that for the first time it codifies um, the role of indigenous participation and indigenous knowledge in executing an international agreement. Uh, and it's, it should be celebrated for that because it's, it's setting a model for something that's never been done before um, in the international uh, multilateral uh, spaces. 
Okay, I'm just going to mention the elephant in the room because nobody else really, really said it. Um, we've got some really big geopolitical challenges right now um, that are, are preventing us from being able to really achieve um, a, a real international cooperation. It's not just Russia. Uh, China is a really big outlier here um, with a great deal of ambition, with a great deal of resources, and they have consistently been throughout three years in a row now, a uh, research cruise right through the Arctic. Um, and uh, we are not meet, we are not meeting that level of ambition, nor do I see a pathway in which we can catch up to, to some of those things. So I think there's a competitive um, challenge. Uh, there's a geopolitical challenge and we can't even talk to one of our neighbors. And that plays to the scientific diplomacy, uh, the science diplomacy piece of this, because while the US government folks have, have rules, science diplomacy has always been this like secret sauce of who can talk to who. Uh, and and who can keep some relationships going um, in the absence of uh, your formal governmental mechanisms kind of failing at the moment. So I love this question. I see opportunities in every single one of those. And, uh, and I took the mic, I was waiting for this one. So I took the floor for a little bit longer because there was, there's a lot I think we can explore together. And, uh, uh, and again, Ben teed me up super nicely for that. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, there's definitely some themes to the challenges as we head from the, the bright spots and the opportunities to you know, the challenges of navigating these spaces where there are a lot of different coordinating organizations. It's tricky, especially in the Arctic, but possibly for the Antarctic as well. Um, how we prioritize our limited resources, money, and time is definitely tricky. Um, data management and how we share that definitely requires trust. Um, science diplomacy can quickly be politicized as Kelly and others have been mentioning. Um, logistics and support for researchers in both of these areas is critically needed and has to be sustained. And that's a unique challenge when working in the polls. Um, and are the right incentives in place to sort of collaborate and coordinate, um, especially to overcome challenges and to keep that going. Um, and I'm sure there's many more. <laughs> if I could have listed them all, I would have. Um, I think we're going to want to turn it open to everybody else, especially the other PRB members, those in the room and virtually, um, and if time allows for others to also ask questions and provide some comments. Um, and the one thing I guess I'm holding as we open this is just what Kelly left us with, right? Even when you're thinking about some of the challenges, how do we turn it into opportunities? How can we think about what PRB or other, or other coordinating organizations and, and entities can do to help overcome these challenges? Um, how, even though this is not about IPY, as Martin said when we opened it, how do we think about that opportunity and how PRB aligns to that as an opportunity to try and overcome some of these challenges for coordination too? Um, so of course, I welcome the panel if you have more thoughts and advice for all of us on that, but of course also the PRB members if you've got questions and comments on that or anything else that you heard. Um, the floor is now open. I'll try and monitor people virtually as you have your hand raised. Um, and hopefully, Martin, you can uh, look in the room in person too. Yes, I'll assist. Thanks, Andrea. So, questions, comments? Is it okay, Mark? Question. Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess the, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I was talking to Matt earlier about it. And that's, um, we had a meeting in Anchorage. It was, um, th there's a partnership between NOAA, Alaska Native Tribal um, Health Consortium and Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. And so we met up there in Anchorage recently to go over the unmet needs report. And it was a really good meeting, I think two or three days. Anyway, trying to figure out, you know, um, there's all the unmet needs of environmental threatened communities. And so um, thinking about federal bureaucracy and um, the pace sometimes that it takes to get things done and, um, you know, lack of not maybe some lack of knowledge on the local level and vice versa, lack of knowledge of uh, federal agencies. Um, I guess my question is to Kelly, you know, there's, um, there was talk earlier here about uh, 
just briefly, and I heard it at those meetings briefly too, about a sense of urgency to um, take care of the people in Alaska, you know, with their their homes flooding, their um, <laughs> all kinds of erosion happening, just just on and on and on. But um, there's there's so many unmet needs <clears throat> that you know who can. Um, combat some of those needs and how can um you know like is there some kind of system that will that could be put into place that triggers all the agencies have to work together despite the um some of the bureaucracy uh so just i guess uh you can understand some of my question there of is there any other kind of mechanism that will trigger um, a, a sense of urgency to take it, uh, take care of some of these needs by the federal government. Thank you for that question. For those of you who might not be aware, uh, in the first year of this administration, NOAA conducted a series of listening sessions. Uh, and this partnership with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium uh, resulted from that. Uh, so it was, it was uh, trying to, hear from the community and be responsive to needs that we were hearing. Um, so th this came out of that. It was one of the first uh, efforts that the ANTHC has taken also on, on climate risk. Uh, so it was uh, it's a little bit new for them as well. And I think uh, your comment speaks to a, a, a number of aspects. And, and sometimes as agencies, we focus on uh, the infrastructure pieces, they feel tangible, they feel fixable. Uh, as we hear frequently in Alaska throughout the Arctic, um, uh, the risks that are happening go beyond infrastructure to um, uh, food security, food sovereignty, cultural security. Uh, there's, there's things at play here that um, this partnership can hopefully address. I heard I, I, the readout from that meeting uh, I'm sorry I couldn't attend. Uh, there, there were uh, rich discussions and I think uh, you highlighted points that have been made. There are a lot of pain points in the federal process. Um, uh, I, I, I heard of, uh, that our NOFO, which I have had to ask a hundred times what it means, notice of funding, okay? I think that's right, notice of funding. Opportunity. opportunity, there we go, um, 300 pages. I don't want to read 300 pages to apply for a grant, um, but I, that's the process is onerous. And, and so some of the conversation coming out of that is how do we reduce that burden um, of the federal bureaucratic process to meet the needs of communities who are, who are on a timeline that is not consistent um, with the typical federal timeline um, for uh, uh, not only just how we get appropriated um, how we make announcements, how we make decisions, and, and ultimately execute the, the funding, which in itself is a challenge. Um, how do we, uh, uh, how do we, with these new relationships that we're forming, how do we put those mechanisms in place that can get those resources directly to communities on a timeline commensurate with the need? Uh, and I think that that's something that we're still working through. So there is an urgency. I think there's a conversation about how we do that. To the point about how we coordinate that across the interagency, I feel like you've asked a very compelling question and, and I feel like I'm not the only one who should answer that. Um, uh, in that. In the spirit of kind of the starting talking point about infrastructure, we tend to do that really well in an emergency or we do it better than if we're, uh, if we're confronted with a long timeline of, of advanced planning and the opportunity to, to be super well coordinated. When it comes to responding to Typhoon Murbach, um, that there are mechanisms in place to facilitate that kind of interagency uh, coordination. The same with a local example um, uh, with the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, this, is, this is a huge interagency process and we figure out a way to do that. Um, from my observation, and I, I would turn to some of the folks who have a much longer um, uh, history of federal service, but in the two and a half years I've been at NOAA, that sometimes it feels that emergencies drive that kind of conversation. And, um, and I would ask, is that the model 
uh, that is, uh, is most likely to generate the permanent results that we would like to see in terms of uh, federal decision making. So I think I got all of the points, but if I missed any, uh, let me know. And I probably asked a few more questions back at everyone uh, rather than, I don't have a good answer for some of those. So I don't know if anybody else on this panel wants to uh, contribute to that. I'm joining with a sigh because I, I've got to be careful how I how I say this because it's it's a very delicate topic. But one thing I just wanted to mention is that I think we need to learn how to communicate with communities in Alaska and not just to the communities in Alaska. Let them help define the problem with us and define solutions with us. And I say that a little cautiously because a big focus that we have in DOE is, is in prediction. And uh, the predictions are not looking very good for the, for the Arctic over the next 20, 30, 40 years uh, with climate change. It's uh, something which uh, we're trying to grapple with even within DOE, the scientific community is. Uh, we're trying to identify, are there really solutions in the pipeline that we could execute and implement in rapid ways. And that's a tricky problem because um, you know, I think the general rule of thumb is that even if we deploy clean energy solutions in a rapid way, uh, the sea levels still continue to rise. It's not gonna just suddenly stop overnight. It, the permafrost is not gonna stop thawing. It's gonna continue thawing. And I, and I think that we just need to have this uh, joint approach with uh, the stakeholders and the communities on how do we deal with this? Uh, because uh, I think there is a perception that the moment you start implementing a clean energy technology or some other technology, the problem is slowly or quickly going to just go away. And um, it's a delicate subject. And, and I know it came up during the meetings at the UN on island states in the South Pacific. How do you, how do you deal with this issue? And it's the same problem with uh, the Arctic. Um, so I'm throwing a problem on the table without a solution. I'm just saying that we need a collective approach on how we deal with this. Could, could I jump in and address Adelheid's question a little? You talked about the pain of dealing with the federal government not the least with respect to village relocation. So put aside the fact that that is a very costly uh, option. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to do something about it. Um, now, all of you who paid attention in your civics classes will know that when the president signs an act of Congress, it goes into force. But that doesn't mean that it's immediately in any shape or form to be enforced or be executed. As in many cases, the act of Congress ends up in the hands of the agency lawyers who write the rules and regulations. And this is where the, one of the problems lies with respect to village relocation. There are multiple agencies have authority with respect to village relocation in Alaska or else, anywhere else in the United States. The, one of the big problems is they have their own particular rules and regulations. And unfortunately, because of that, the agencies responsible or having some responsibility for village relocation are often struggling against each other because the rules and regulations are misaligned. So, one solution I suggested a couple of weeks ago at the Kennedy School of Government mm -hmm. one day Arctic workshop was put the lawyers in a room along with a bunch of subject matter experts to help them. I don't let them out until they've <coughs> rewritten the rules and regulations so they're all aligned for the benefit of the people who are supposed to be helped by the government. Thanks. I want to revert back to one thing that I said earlier, uh, which is the bright spot of this, which is uh, 
I've never seen interagency coordination like it does happen in Alaska. So there's hope for this. Um, we cannot do it alone. Agencies up, working up in Alaska um, and in the Arctic understand this. We rely on each other. Um, uh, we share more information. So I think that the model, again, is starting uh, in Alaska and in the Arctic and can be a model for the rest of coordination. Um, uh, I think this is an exportable uh, thing if the US government can get it uh, better, get it done better and more effectively and um, in a more user-friendly way for uh, for our constituents. Um, anyway, I think there's a bright spot there because that that coordination and that collaboration between the interagency is already part of the way that we have to do business there. Thanks. Thank you, Adelheid, for the good question. Thank you to all the panelists for your responses. Um, with the time remaining, we'd like to move on to Jenny and then hopefully Michael will have time for both of your questions before we close at the bottom of the hour. Thanks. Um, Jenny Vaisman, uh, International Polar Consultant is what my name tag says, so I, I love that. Um, we, we've heard today, and, and the community also says this, um, the U.S. is having a bit of an issue, I think, um, right? You look at the Antarctic program, probably not very much deep field research for the next decade. Um, Kelly mentions it before, China has three research cruises across the Arctic. The icebreakers, we we're having problems with that. Some effort is being made. Um, I don't think we are the best anymore. Um, I know that's probably not what we wanna hear. I do think that our universities are still good. We're still attracting international scientists. They're coming, they're training here and they're going back to their countries. Um, is there a role for the PRB in, I don't know, the, convincing government agencies that we've got to do something to up our game because we are really behind. Well, the PRB does have an advisory function and you can, I mean, let's say the Academy exercises that all the time. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold back. But we have to be asked by government to advise the government. We can't lobby them. We have to be asked by the government to advise it on a particular topic. We can't lobby an advocate. But individuals can. Can the congressman, woman, senator? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's a fundamental lack of understanding at the agencies about the missing infrastructure and what the holdup is in the USAP right now. There's just a lot of concerted effort to overcome the obstacles that we have with the resources that we have. I think the icebreaker question is a bigger one. There have been reports, Academy reports about icebreaker needs and other organizations. And I think NSF is working to get back ahead of the bow wave that was created by COVID and get back to supporting research in the Antarctic. So it's not that we're not aware and some of it's a resource issue and some is just, it takes time to dig out of that. I'll follow up on that and, and say, I don't think there's a lack of, uh, uh, we would love to do more. Uh, I, and I'm speaking on behalf of NOAA, we have, there's so much we could do and we would love to do. Uh, so I don't think it's a, a lack of um, understanding um, or even prioritization, but I do think at very high level, and this is taking it beyond any one agency, the lack of political will. Um, and the lack of political will uh, is sometimes underpinned by just a lack of understanding. Uh, and, and so how do we, uh, how do we inform and this has been a conversation, I, I don't know, since the beginning of time, how one, we're an Arctic nation, um, but how do we convince um, uh, the constituency in the lower 48 of the importance of doing work in a state that may, they may never visit? Uh, and I, I, I do feel like my favorite, my favorite thing to say is, you know, when I first moved to Washington DC, there was no such thing as an Arctic vortex. Um, I'm experiencing the Arctic pretty regularly now. Uh, so uh, what's happening in the Arctic is not staying in the Arctic. 
the teleconnections between what's happening there and, and what's gonna be happening to each of us as a result of climate change um, are real. And, uh, um, and we can prepare for them or we can react to them. So uh, I don't have the answer to the question of how do we build that political will? Uh, you know, it's one state with some, uh, with some pretty uh, passionate uh, congressional delegates, um, but they're three out of 600 and X. Uh, so, you know, how do you elevate that uh, amongst in, the, in, in what is our political system? Uh, and the, the chambers of Congress, the, the way that the agencies function um, within to, uh, uh, to Martin's point about kind of the sequencing of things and, and who's making those decisions. Um, I'm just kind of spitballing now, but I think it's an interesting question and I, it's one I'm grappling with myself uh, in, the, in the role that I have. How do, we, how do we convince others of the importance of this work so that we are not outcompeted this is not a comfortable place for Americans to be. We, we like to be at the top um, on scientific research on all of the things in which we, we participate in. So how do we uh, make the case for maintaining, um, you know, the, uh, the really high quality uh, scientific enterprise that the United States brings to um, all of its research, but specifically the Arctic research enterprise. Go ahead. So let me bring it back maybe to the international topic in this regard. I think IPY is a big opportunity for us where we can coordinate and where, you know, where we can gain visibility on the on the on the you know highest level. And I think, and I said to April earlier, you know, it's an opportunity also for 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 NASA, for me for me personally almost as a NASA person to um, create so much visibility that I can talk to my management to allocate funds, you know, for, you know, 2030, 2032, or, and then, you know, you know, ramping up to it. So I think IPY is it's a fantastic opportunity to show coordination, not only within the country, but also internationally. And I think we really need to take advantage of this, and I'm super interested in this. And I said to April, I, I want to stay and get as much as engaged as I can, because I think it's a, it's a real good opportunity to maybe. And you know, people I've heard from Norbert Untersteiner. You know Norbert Untersteiner. Mm -hmm. You know, he basically said he so um, he's a CI scientist from Seattle, and he basically said, if I remember correctly, like the, the International uh, Geophysical Year 1950. Uh, I think or the third. Hmm? 57, 57, 58. It brought you know polar science to the table before there was no si polar science in, in the United States. So IPY is, I think it's a huge opportunity for us to get coordinated and to make something happen that's very visible and where you know our bosses, NOAA, NASA's bosses, can move something up and get some you know funds allocated, hopefully. That's wishful thinking. I share, um, you know, Kelly's concern about unfunded mandate. It's a very popular term right now, unfortunately. But I think IPY is a huge opportunity. And Michael um, or Mike, you'd had your hand up previously. Do you still have a question? Um, I, actually, I think Jenny captured it very well. I'll just I'll just reiterate and emphasize what she said. And um, I think those of us who work in the Antarctic are very concerned about, um, you know, the future as far as international collaboration uh, and, you know, with our own projects there. So um, I'll just echo everything she said and say, like, we are eager to know how we can help address those, those issues. If there's anything we can do with PRB or in the research community. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jenny. Um, well, then I see John has his hand up. He'll get the last question. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to comment, or maybe it's a question is, maybe we can use IPY to, to address what has been maybe a pendulum swing in between science and infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we can't do one without the other. I mean, we don't want to just do infrastructure. We'll fail if we try to just do science. Uh, but we have 10 years or eight years to IPY, and it'd be nice to see a balanced program that would go forward, show progress on infrastructure, 
can show that the science and new science is, is being done. That would be a great outcome. I make a comment. I just wanted to add one comment. And that is, that IPY could really put put us back on the map with science diplomacy if that's something we wanted to do. If we turn the clock back, there was a big Indian Ocean experiment, way probably fifty years ago, and that was a huge effort to build up science diplomacy in an international effort. And right now, there's enough tension in the Arctic that this may be an opportunity to really push that and uh, make that a centerpiece, you know, not the centerpiece, but one of the centerpieces of IPY. Just, just a suggestion. Adriana, I'm, I'm going to jump in here if that's okay. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. Um, we lost uh, Nancy Sung from Cambridge Bay, um, but she was able to, to join us for a short time. But everybody, thank you for your thoughts and your responses to the, the questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this was not about IPY at the request of an unnamed agency, but nevertheless, much of what we heard will inform the work we do as we go forward to try and lead to a fabulous, outstanding U.S. contribution to International Polar Year. So um, that concludes the three panels for the day. Um, the open session remains open. Um, so everyone who is here in the room and connected by Zoom, you're welcome to stay. And we have 30 minutes or so now for anyone who cares. And we'll begin with the board members, perhaps give them priority uh, before we ask others to chime in, to reflect on the day, um, what you've heard, what gave you pause, what gave you cause for optimism? Um, what are some of the key points, things we need to focus on? <clears throat> Anything that will add to the conversation and help us to, to move the ball forward on international polling. I open the floor, hands in the air, yellow hands online, Zoom, or, or whatever. Adriana and I will keep an eye open for both kinds. And I saw a numbness hand first, so please go ahead. Yeah, we thank you, Martin. Uh, we had a great day with three very different panels and a lot of things to think about. Like one of the key messages we I, I heard was that. Last time we had four years ramping up about give or take, and this time we have twice the amount of time. So there is um, a lot more time to plan. And there's also a lot more time to be optimistic. Even with the most challenging situations with the geopolitics that we were talking about, eight years is, it goes by fast, but it is also a long time uh, where there's always hope for change. So I think just seeding good efforts at this time that's what excites me. And uh, I really um, enjoyed learning from the lessons from the past to see what we can do differently and how we can go forward. So just looking forward to that work, to that momentum. Um, and the sooner we get to mobilizing resources, to, to taking actions, um, the greater will be the momentum. So th that was some of my key messages that I got today. So I just thought that was good. And thank you to Kelly for raising some of the big issues that we hadn't really thought up in the morning. But I do think even there, even in the most challenging issues, I always feel more optimistic with the timeline. I mean, the geopolitics will also change. It changed in the last decade, it will change in the next decade. Uh, science remains stable. The, the passion for science goes a long way. And that diplomacy will also help. Thank you, Anatma. Others, comments, questions? 
sure. It's only four twenty four thirty five. Lynn's hand is raised virtually. Please, please go ahead, uh, Vladimir Romanovsky. Thank you, uh, Vladimir Romanovsky. I'm uh, U.S. representative to ISIRA, which means International Science Initiative in Russian and the Russian Arctic. Uh, I just starting this this uh, um, duty, and uh, uh, I I will have my five minutes tomorrow afternoon uh, to say a couple of words. But uh, I think this uh, science diplomacy in the broader science uh, means not only science but diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, indigenous diplomacy. There is more than just science diplomacy. I think, I think this is the way. Uh, actually, I understand that the panel already done, but I have a question. Uh, how delicate uh, is the question about cooperation with uh, countries like Russia well, or uh, China in your agencies? How openly you can discuss these questions? Maybe I can start since I work for the more delicate one. Um, we can certainly talk about issues and express uh, suggestions on how cooperation could be enhanced, but there are still barriers right now. I can. We can informally talk about cooperation. Um, I can um, uh, I can describe the, the guidance we've received in in um, in the Arctic Council. So um, right now, um, even though we are able to meet uh, in a group setting virtually um, with Russians uh, present, um, we've uh, we we have the guidance not to not not to have any direct communication. Um, with our Russian counterparts, and that um, any any communications that we do need to convey should be carried out via uh, the secretariats. Um, so um, they also don't would would prefer we not have any one on one uh, meetings or communication, and um, if uh, to, to keep basically keep everything either in a group setting. <laughs> or have communications be delivered via a third party like a secretary. Uh, not uh, communication with Russian counterparts. It's un understandable, that's, that's very difficult, but uh, discussion about, about how to uh, promote and how to do organize uh, this diplomacy whatever it is. So uh, it's, it's not formal like uh, communication or, or, or any kind of formal or even informal exchange with the Russian authorities. No, just about uh, uh, the problem and about uh, what could be done and kind of discussion about uh, and discussion of some ideas which are well already going around how to, to deal with that in a situation like this a geopolitical situation like this right now. I'm gonna build a little bit on that and I'm sorry, I'm a little split focused. I was supposed to be in a meeting at 4.30 and um, uh, the, the situation's dynamic. And so, uh, but I think I got the gist of this. So uh, to Ben's point, uh, there's a few things we can do in a multilateral setting. Um, we are not prohibited from speaking to Russia. Um, we can do that on the margins, uh, as long as it is solely on the topic for which we are negotiating. Um, so for example, next week I'll be in Korea for the central Arctic ocean fisheries agreement. Russia is a party, uh, and they will be present. We've been holding these meetings in Korea because they have the ability to offer visas. Uh, so accommodations are being made to, to help maintain, I think what has been a basic kind of 
I don't know if it's policy or a tenant or an understanding uh, of the interest in keeping the Arctic a peaceful um, place uh, for collaboration and, and not have it uh, go a different direction. And, and so I think that there are efforts being made to try and facilitate that through the restrictions that we have. Uh, I can't email my Russian counterparts um, independently. Uh, I can't, so it has to happen on in person um, there. They can, I'm chairing some negotiations um, through this mechanism. Uh, there are virtual, uh, we have participants from all 10 parties um, and uh, I can, I can communicate with everyone who's participating in that working group. Uh, so we're very, very limited. That said, we're not as limited as some of our other Arctic partners. Canada has far more restrictions than, uh, yeah, than, than we do. So it, it's an interesting position the United States uh, falls in. So um, like we can have those conversations on the margins to try and advance um, consensus on a, on the topic we're negotiating, but uh, uh, but some of our negotiating partners in that agreement don't have the ability. So the United States can be an interlocutor in some ways. Again, solely focused on the ability to 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 get to consensus on the issue at hand. And so I think where we can do that, it's an opportunity. Um, uh, but again, we've mentioned this at times, we have deep, deep constraints um, uh, established by the White House, um, by the State Department at times, um, uh, by Congress. And, uh, and so we're restricted and we have to, we really need to follow those rules. That does not apply to all Americans. Um, it applies to the, uh, those in service of the US government. Okay, can I, uh, can I jump in here and say, well, I, I know that the topic of collaboration, cooperation with Russia is important to many people. It's also a very thorny issue and it's getting us away from reflecting on our day. Um, so I'd like to bring it back to that. Um, I see some hands up online. So I'm first going to go to, to Lynn uh, on Zoom and then to uh, Andre and then back to Twyla. Lynn, please go ahead. I, I just was doing, uh, expressing a little bit in the chat too. Um, the, um, I work mostly in Antarctic um, research and um, Southern Ocean research. And we've had this double whammy with the USAP pro problem um, with their funding and um, significant drop in you know, basically um, discouraging all field work proposals that require USAP resources. But the NSF has also been hammered. Um, and I, I assume that those are completely independent problems. Um, I really appreciated your point, Kelly, about um, uh, getting the word out about the importance of this, um, of these regions and studying these regions. How does the, the normal citizen support A, um, Antarctic and Antarctic, Antarctic research and B, science um, from the point of view of the National Science Foundation? And I guess what I'm concerned about, as I put in the chat, is that um, we are already having to move our, our precious graduate students into different areas because of this lack of funding, um, even though we've been very well funded. So, you know, moving to tropical and other types of climate um, aspects. Um, so it means that we're going to be losing a cohort, I think, across the board. Um, and, and those who've been trained in grad school to work in the field. Just, just a comment. Okay, thanks, Concern. Lynn. Thanks for that observation. I don't think it requires an answer. And I'd like to go to Andre, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Margaret. So Andre Petrov, alternate delegate to I, I, uh, I ask. So I just want to maybe turn us a little back to bigger picture. So I really do think as the person could be involved from the very start of discussion about IPY, we are this what where where we should be? I'm really happy with the discussion. I think it both goes to the praise of the international uh, planning committee and I ask and Scar for for navigating us to to the point we are. I think you know the the first phase we always been talking about is an excitement, generating knowledge and excitement at IPY, and I think we are really doing that. That's really good. Uh, the other uh, point I want to also make is that on the Arctic side, at least, we have a lot of opportunity to learn from ICAR process. 
And we really do need to make this connection because uh, things like engaging indigenous scholars, indigenous knowledge and rights, rights holders is a process that's going on under I ICARP for right now. And while it's not perfect, I'm sure we'll have a lot of um, things to improve. We would be able to capitalize on some of that. And in the previous panel was mentioned, right? Uh, so bringing, bringing indigenous voices and indigenous leadership into the process may give us um, you know, some uh, opportunities to learn for IPY. Uh, now we seemingly at the stage when we need to be really stepping up our work as a PRB to, uh, to make sure that uh, two things happen, right? I mean, we need to still continue generating excitement and knowledge. And you know, ideas that are being floated today, you know, making sure that we connecting to the lawmak lawmakers and to the bigger society at large so that there is this uh, snowball that is unstoppable, which will lead to uh, getting, uh, getting IPY funding. But another comment and the question that, uh, that I guess we're not supposed to be talking about this in the panel, but, but if we just imagine that we're talking about you know, large scale cooperation project, such as IPY, not necessarily, what do we need to do as a PRB for, for individual agencies to be engaged? What are the most effective ways? Is it meetings with the leadership? Is it some kind of report, which we're supposed to be asked to write, but still, is it like, what is the most effective that would help propel this to the top of this one, two, three list? Or is it, is it anything? Maybe we should have some sort of workshop in DC. I don't know. There's a lot of ideas. Maybe something we could do as part of Arctic Science Summit Week. I don't know. Just, uh, just if there are any ideas in the room from the panel or anyone else, that's really where we are. Thank you. If I could at least begin to respond to that. I mentioned earlier today that we have in the plan our first IPY workshop that will involve primarily early career people. But that's not the only workshop that at least April and I have talked about and we've talked about a follow-up workshop, which might be rather similar to one of the workshops held prior to IPY4, and one that involved significant agency participation to open up that discussion and effort to convince the agencies that this is important. We would really like you to get involved and play your part in convincing the powers that be, the money bags, to fund international, a US contribution to international polio with new money, not mere reallocation of existing money. So it's a multi-level, multi-sector effort. And we have to come up with essentially a plan for who's who's responsible for what, at what time, along that eight year ramp up to 2032. So we are talking about additional workshops at least. And then also, as you've alluded to, taking advantage of other opportunities, other conferences and so on, to include an IPY part to that, to engage with the broader community and get their input uh, and so on. But that's, that's just a part of it. There's many other options available if we only put our minds to it and use our imaginations. So this may sound like a really dumb question, but what is it you hope to achieve at the end of IPY? In other words, what is the end state supposed to look like where you can say that you are successful because of IPY. And if we can define what that is and work backwards to, to, you know, to decide what should happen between now and IPY and during IPY, that would help at least DOE to know what the expectation is. So maybe it's a dumb question because I wasn't here all day, but. It's not a dumb question at all, Gary, and it's one that we're grappling with, and that's why we would have these workshops to get guidance and advice from the broader community. Um, I'll throw this out. Um, 
we can't do everything. Some people are going to be unhappy because decisions were made, choices were made that don't match their particular research interests or, or whatever. Um, but but we, those difficult decisions have to be made. Um, my own view on what are we looking for for outcomes of IPY? We heard from Julie Brigg and Gretti and others that this is our opportunity to finally get Alaska natives and Arctic indigenous peoples fully involved in an equal fashion in Arctic research and related uh, matters. I think that's very important. Um, I think we have to look at outcomes of IPY as things that are of not just regional Arctic and Antarctic significance, but of global significance. And to my mind, that is the state of the ice sheets and glaciers and ice caps and sea level rise. It's the warming and thawing permafrost and sequestration or the undoing of uh, sequestered carbon and uh, greenhouse gas enhancement in the atmosphere, the consequences of that for global heating, but also the, the impact of warming and thawing permafrost on Arctic and Antarctic infrastructure. We, there is evidence that Antarctic permafrost is now warming in the dry valleys, for example, and leading to releases of greenhouse gases, previously thought to be well and truly locked in there. And then the other, the other item is the diminishing Arctic sea ice cover, and now the Antarctic sea ice cover, which has flipped and is shrinking quite rapidly, and the consequences for weather and climate at mid and lower latitudes. I think we can't, we have to choose things and place a high priority on research that is going to be of global value. I think that is what will get the attention of the Hill, for example. Some on the Hill. Some will, but we also have to make the argument, how much of Florida do you want underwater? And how much of beachfront property do you want to disappear? Never to be recovered. Um, but I, I think it's, it's topics that have significant societal impact if we can only organize ourselves and do the research to make these leap ahead discoveries that will help us improve for example our modeling and prediction projection capabilities which then helps the policy makers and the planners and the engineers and so on who have to deliver the solution would anyone like to Add to that, disagree. You know, Martin, thank you for finishing our plan for IPY. <laughs> I hope somebody was taking notes, right? Yeah, go home and write. <laughs> to be honest, that pretty much sounded like the last IPY's plan, so you might want to tweak it a little. That's the challenge for having, making your case for another IPY, someone, someone clever on the Hill, there are such people will ask, didn't you have one recently? Didn't you answer these questions? Why do you need more? Um, Matt, Matthew, um, Dr oh, Twyla, sorry. Yeah, I'll your pardon. Twyla oh. first and then Matthew. Yeah, I was gonna call on myself actually, because part of um, uh, what I have is uh, also, uh, well, responds to what you were just noting, but um, so some of my reflection from the day, um, and especially co-moderating um, our um, indigenous um, lead, indigenous-led research panel, was that frankly there's a lot of information out there that we are ignoring or not putting to work at all. One of the things that we heard was that. People have felt the are uh, these indigenous people who are, you know, speaking about these topics over and over have felt that they are saying the same thing over and over again, um, which to me says that we are missing some space of listening. And we heard so many suggestions of places to receive information, information from the new Center for Braiding Indigenous 
um, knowledge in science, um, from the Inuit Circumpolar Council, from Kawarik, um, from reports and um, priorities published at any number of different meetings or conferences or from individual tribes. But there's frankly a lot out there as far as what community priorities are um, and what those interests are and that we on our end are failing to actually engage with those different resources and understand what are the skills, what are the tools, what are those areas of support that we have, that we have access to that can Venn diagram with these priorities. And I do think this is a really important area that the Polar Research Board has that ability to survey the scene of information that is out there, to provide synthesis and summary, um, and to look at what those requests mean as far as what we can do in the kind of more formal Western research space. And also to recognize the NGOs and others who are already existing as leaders, existing as leading organizations. Um, you know, I think the, the PRB has done well in increasing some of our membership that has better direct connections in Alaska and also better direct um, indigenous connections, but there's more that can be done there. So to me, I heard really a lot of work that is openly available for us to do and engage in and that we are not doing. And I think one of the things actually, just in responding to what you just said, Martin, was that you mentioned a couple times, we need to do you know, IPY is about globally important research. But part of what I think we actually need to start doing now is we need to start helping people to understand that locally relevant is globally relevant. Because I've been engaged, you know, in research that thinks on regional global scales a very long time. And I can't tell you how many people hear this sort of, here's a global perspective, perspective or here's a regional perspective, but that is not something that you can take action with. <laughs> For the vast majority of people, decision makers, planners, all of those who we look to serve in the science beyond science for science space, need use cases, need local information. And so I think that it's part of us being able to make these connections and demonstrate that there's only so much use for having global climate model results. That is not an end point. And for many, many people and groups, that is not a beginning point for their decision making. And so I think this IPY and especially having an indigenous perspective that we can do better at listening to and engaging and bringing up can help us to make these connections um, and, and embrace those parts that are the connected earth system and that cross these scales so that people start to understand how they're all connected. So um, yeah, I, there are a lot more things I had down here, but those are some of my key elements I really wanted to share. Thanks. Thanks, Twyla. I'm going to claim that we were just saying the same thing, but in different in different fashion. Um, Matthew. Thank you, Martin. Um, well said, Twyla. I, I think I agree with most of your points there. I, I, I think um, just reflecting on the day, uh, you know, we, we learned that the next IPY uh, peace, international peace will come out in, in October. Um, I, I think there is a real need for the PRB to really invest in a, a solid communication plan about what IPY is meant to be. One that speaks to the research community, indigenous communities, policymakers, funders, the public, and, and bring in experts that can help us with that. Because, you know, Martin laid out <coughs> some ideas that, that make a lot of sense from the scientific perspective, but, you know, it sounds a lot like the last IPY. I think we, we, we need to communicate something that is different, that not only you know, allows us to, as Twyla said, kind of 
listen, but to, but to demonstrate that we have been listening, um, to use someone else's words, I can't remember who said it, you know, we, we have an expanded definition today of what diversity is, why diversity matters. That needs to be incorporated into how we communicate what IPY will be. We need to break through the noise. I mean, as Thorsten said, there, there's a lot of international efforts ongoing. How do we really allow the international community, then the, the U.S. community, to, to see that this is something to really pay attention to? Um, and we're also, as we have been for many years, facing a lot of distrust in science. And that's where I, I think we, we really need to invest in the communication side of this, starting starting now, but, but, but really probably, you know, in fall after the next communication comes out from the international groups. Um, I, I think it's going to be really critically important to, to demonstrate that we are doing something different. Thank you. Bill Montine, you wanted to add something. Could you introduce yourself, please? Howdy. Thank you very much. Um, Bill Muntean, former State Department official, currently with the Think Tank Center for Strategic International Studies. Um, I would just want to congratulate uh, PRB for already starting what is going to be a key phrase for me is process. Um, I feel very fortunate to be able to be here um, and that you have allowed and started this process of including um, not just the particular federal stakeholders um, and the scientific community, but also the indigenous community and the broader community um, such as myself. Speaking of process though, um, some folks to consider for uh, future uh, engagement, whether it's on the communication strategy or anything else, uh, particularly on the national security side, uh, that is a major risk aspect. Um, it probably would be worthwhile um, to bring them in sooner rather than later for the socialization process. That would be State Department, NSC, and to a certain extent, Congress. Also related to um, a major uh, concern, funding Congress as well. So um, to the extent that they are involved potentially in the, uh, not just a recipient of uh, the uh, plan, but possibly uh, are at least invited to having that possibility to contribute to the plan. There may be some on the Hill that would be welcoming of the opportunity. And since um, I believe there's uh, any number of needs that might be out here uh, on the scientific front, uh, their assistance with prioritizing uh, may or may not be relevant. Um, similarly, um, a third group would be to consider states. Um, this would be not just Alaska, but we already talked about um, Florida going underwater. I resisted how much of what Florida we wanted to be underwater um, from answering that question. Um, but um, there's other states that may um, be relevant in this. Um, we know that California has played a significant role in funding itself through its own mechanisms, climate change research and response and adaptation efforts. Um, they may or may not be relevant in future conversations. Uh, related to um, IPY5. But again, thank you very much to PRB for starting this process early um, and uh, looking for an inclusive process. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. I see no yellow Zoom hands raised. Anybody else in the room or on Zoom like to have the final word? I see Ken Doing the old-fashioned way. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, Thank you. Um, one um, uh, kind of phrase I wanted to bring in, and uh, didn't have the opportunity in the in the Q and A we had here. Um, climate climate services, and uh, this is kind of um, inspired by uh, remarks that Twyla was making. So um, there is. Uh, a large, I would say, kind of movement afoot, at least within the, the climate research enterprise to do this kind of transition from um, state of the knowledge reporting, state of the science to more of a climate services oriented framework. And by climate services, I, I essentially mean uh, providing more targeted 
tailored, fit for purpose um, data, expertise, information products that are that are intended to meet the needs of kind of climate sensitive decision points for um, for resilience, for for adap for adaptation. And within the interagency, there's been some reorganization under the U.S. Global Change Research Program uh, to do just that, to actually um, where we set up a new interagency subcommittee focused on climate services to parallel what has long been an interagency subcommittee on, on research. Um, and the idea here I wanted to bring up is kind of thinking about climate services within the Arctic domain. Um, you know, that is providing environmental climate intelligence to assist with uh, decision making, primarily on the adaptation resiliency front um, in, in Arctic communities. Thank you, Ben. It's five minutes past five. Um, we could go on. I'm sure, some would be happy to, but I suggest we uh, conclude for the day. I'll do that by thanking the panelists here in the room right now and those who were panelists earlier in the day, the moderators who kept the panel discussions uh, moving along. And I'd just simply like to thank everybody else for, for being here and participating in the meeting, contributing to it. We've gathered a lot of very useful and valuable information um, that we'll have to sift through and make more sense of with respect to PRB and the fifth international polar year. Um, but I think overall, this has been a very good day, which will help us um, move the ball forward um, more than a little bit and a, a lot over the next eight years. So thanks again, everyone. Um, tomorrow, the board will meet in the members room, which is that way behind April. Um, it shouldn't be too difficult to find. And that is a day to learn more about what is going on uh, inside IASC and SCAR and the working groups of each of those organizations. And we'll be hearing from the US participants and representatives in those groups um, on what's happening. And you'll have a chance to, of course, ask them questions, dig a little deeper perhaps. Um, so we understand what they are doing. And, and, and we could also think of that in terms of um, the international poll year, what they're doing now, what their plans might be for the future, what are their thoughts, what are they thinking about IPY right now, what are they doing in preparation for international poll year, for example. Okay, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Good night.